I'd like to welcome everyone to the second day of the public events in the Positioning Practice in Architecture Conference. Yesterday, Sergio Fajardo, former mayor of Medellin, Colombia, and a, a candidate for Colombian president in 2010, presented a lecture on the recent radical transformation of his home city. And today, Teddy Cruz will present his recent architectural work, and Aaron Levy and Bill Menking will present their work on the exhibition titled Into the Open Positioning Practice. This exhibition was on display in the U.S. Pavilion at the recent Venice Biennale. The current installation in the gallery downstairs was based on this exhibition, and I hope you all have a chance to check it out uh, if you haven't already. Again, I want to thank Aaron Levy for designing this exhibit and Marissa Tyrone and Yutaka Sho for coordinating the installation. Again, uh, I'd like to welcome uh, our colleagues from other departments and organizations across campus and from the city of Syracuse, as well as our colleagues from Cornell University and their students from the College of Architecture, Art, and Planning at Cornell. This event is hopefully uh, one of many future collaborations between the College of Arts and Sciences and the School of Architecture. And again, I want to thank Deans Mark Robbins and George Langford for their uh, support of this collaborative model for this event. I'd also like to thank Francisco Sanin from the School of Architecture and Greg Lambert from the Humanities Corridor uh, for being excellent collaborators on this event today. Now I'd like to introduce Greg Lambert is Dean's Professor of the Humanities and the Founding Director of the Humanities Center here at Syracuse University. Welcome to the second day of what has turned out to be uh, the inaugural event of uh, the 2009 calendar of the Humanities Corridor. I am the Project Director of the uh, Mellon, uh, Andrew W. Mellon Humanities Corridor, which is, connects three universities in the central New York region, the University of Rochester, Syracuse University, and Cornell University. And today that uh, presence of the corridor, the connection is really tangibly present by the fact that we have many students here from Cornell. If you are students from Cornell or faculty, can you just either yell out or raise your hand so everybody can see your presence? Yeah, okay, well, <laughs> Cornell in the house, okay. so. Uh, I'd also like to, to recognize the, um, the project or the principal investigator of the grant at Cornell, uh, Professor Tim Murray, who is also the director of the Society of the Humanities. So I just want to say just a few things about the, uh, the Humanities Corridor. We have uh, projects in, fi in five or six different areas, including linguistics, philosophy, culture, and religions, as well as music, musicology, uh, humanities at the intersection of technology and science, and finally, Visual Arts and Culture, which is the cluster that is sponsoring this event today in the two-day iteration. I want to uh, also note that there will be events at all three campuses ongoing for the next year up to next December. There are 28 different working groups and projects that the, the Mellon is sponsoring in this project. And I'm very pleased that this event is the inaugural event. It's been very significant already, and today, will be the uh, keystone or the cap on what has been already an amazing experience as well as, as a vision of social transformation, the relation of architecture and culture in that transformation. Thank you for coming and I hope you enjoy the lecture today. So the structure of today's event has three parts. Uh, Aaron and Bill will present first Teddy will present second, and finally, all three will reconvene here on the stage uh, for a discussion amongst themselves and the audience. So if you have questions, please save them for uh, that discussion session. Aaron Levy is executive director and senior curator at the Slot Foundation in Philadelphia, which is an organization which promotes inventive bottom-up, multidisciplinary, and community-based collaborative arts ventures. Specialist in critical theory and curatorial studies, and he's edited numerous publications and curated many exhibitions focusing on art, architecture, geopolitics, and critical theory as cultural practices of the contemporary avant-garde. He 
also teaches in the English and History of Art departments at the University of Pennsylvania. William Menking was commissioner and curator of the U.S. Pavilion at the 2008 Venice Biennale. He has also curated exhibitions and published extensively on the work of the architecture collectives such as Archigram, Ant Farm, and Super Studio. He's the founder and editor of the Architects newspaper, which highlights developments in architecture, urban design, and planning. He's also a professor in the School of Architecture at Pratt Institute in Brooklyn. He's also on the International Advisory Board of the Architectural Humanities Research Association. Please join me in welcoming Bill and Aaron. Okay. Uh, thanks, John. <clears throat> uh, Aaron and Teddy and I want to thank um, everybody at Syracuse, um, Greg and this, um, the Humanities Corridor and the School of Architecture and Dean Robbins for inviting us um, up here to uh, talk about the exhibition. Um, I want to give a little kind of uh, introductory, uh, few introductory comments um, about the exhibition, the derivation of the exhibition. Uh, and then Aaron will talk a bit about the exhibition itself in Venice. Um, and then together we'll walk you through a number of these different groups, the 16 groups that have been scrolling across the screen downstairs in, uh, in this room. And then of course Teddy will uh, talk about uh, his own work and the work in the exhibition. Um, my own, just for a second, my own sort of interest in all of this um, uh, way of practicing architecture, that is to say, looking at it in terms of exhibitions, uh, comes from, uh, as John said, uh, my past um, experience in curating museum exhibitions on these groups from the 1960s, uh, Archigram and Farm, and you see here uh, Super Studio, and, uh, which was um, an, a really interesting group of self-proclaimed radical architects who practiced in Florence, Italy in, from about 1964 until 1978. And I did an exhibition with an alumnus of uh, Syracuse University, Peter Lang. Uh, we, we spent a lot of time looking at this work. Um, and I wanted to show this one uh, piece of uh, Super Studios. It was kind of their penultimate uh, moment on the international stage. And it just so happened to take place at the Venice Biennale in 1978. The Biennale, which Aaron will speak more about later, is a, a fascinating institution that goes back to the late 19th century uh, as an art exhibition. It's well known as an art exhibition. Every two years, it, it pretends to look at uh, current and contemporary trends in, in the world of art. Uh, architecture began in the early 1950s uh, with people like Johnny Colombo and, and others who began sort of crossing, architects who began crossing into this world of art. Uh, in the 19, late 1960s and early 1970s, architecture began to have a much larger role in the um, uh, art biennale. And of course, you know, one could give an entire lecture on the relationship between art and architecture uh, in, in Italy uh, going back to the 1920s, but um, at least in the 1960s, it began to play an, an increasingly large role uh, in the Art Biennale, with some artists actually doing pieces that would cross, what we might say, into architecture, and then architects getting involved in doing kind of art pieces, uh, art installations in the different pavilions in the Biennale. Um, Super Studio was a, a, a group, as I said, self-proclaimed radicals, uh, who were charging, trying to knock down the uh, barricades of traditional architecture in Italy throughout the late 60s and early 70s. By 1978, when this particular piece was done, their moment was being eclipsed by uh, what came to be called postmodernism, the very famous Strada Novissima, which was a, a kind of incredible exhibition of uh, the new sort of uh, late 70s, early 80s tendencies in postmodernism took place at the Biennale in 1980. So two years later, this kind of work had been totally eclipsed by a new notion of architecture. So these, um, uh, this group of uh, six uh, Florentine radical architects 
did this kind of piece that was meant to sort of uh, usher them out on the international stage. And what you see here is a um, uh, cast iron uh, frame with these four uh, prime sort of shapes in them made out of salt, which they cast in um, uh, kilns. And then uh, this kind of uh, tall structure on the top is dripping salt water taken right out of the Judaica Canal uh, onto these pieces. And then the pieces kind of disappeared over time. That's what the piece was. It was called uh, La Molle de Lot, and it was, um, as I said, their last kind of dying moment on this international stage. And I think it really kind of shows, um, there's a lot that could be said about this, but one of the things that it really shows is the sort of influence and power of the uh, Venice Biennale. Um, Biennales have become a, a, a kind of uh, national uh, game where there, there are biennales all over the world now, Johannesburg, Cairo, uh, Korea, uh, in all kinds of places. But this is really the sort of the oldest one and the one that has this kind of highest profile on the international stage. So the, uh, the, the biennale itself is this incredible kind of institution uh, with this long patronage and this long history, as I said, Aaron will speak about in a moment. And into that, we drop uh, our own kind of idea about what architecture should be. And um, their derivation of that I want to talk about now. Um, now if we s step back and uh, look at our own um, uh, participation in this, it, from my own point of view, comes out of uh, an interest that I have as a city planner. I'm educated and I teach city planning and architecture history at Pratt. So I tend to be on that side of the architecture city planning world which w does or does not want to engage with each other and my interest has always been in the engagement and how can architects and and social planners let's say have uh, uh, a kind of discourse a discussion between each other uh, and I had felt that um, city planning which I teach as a historical uh, as a as a course at Pratt historically really grew out of architecture in the late 19th and early 20th century. Christine Boyer, who's written a great book about this called Dreaming the Rational City, says that it's one of the disciplinary discourses that spread itself horizontally across the landscape, that is city planning. So planning was grabbing from a lot of places, but one of the places it grabbed from was Frederick Law Olmsted, who was a landscape architect, uh, uh, from uh, Raymond Unwin and Ebenezer Howard, Howard was a sort of philanthropist, but other architects, you know, who began to believe that architecture shouldn't just concern itself with the correct uh, uh, creation of the classical orders, but maybe should engage itself with community. Uh, it's a long history, but uh, in the 1920s, there was this group, the Regional Planning Association uh, of America, that was prime spoke spokesman was Lewis Mumford really forcefully made an argument in the 1920s that architecture needed to engage with really profound social problems and social issues. So move up to 1932. This catalog I'm showing you here is the cover for the uh, most famous, I would, I think, one of the most, arguably most famous architecture museum exhibitions. It was called the International, uh, it was called um, Modern Architecture. It came later to be called International Style that was curated by um, uh, Henry Russell Hitchcock, uh, Philip, Barr, uh, Philip Johnson, and Alfred Barr. Um, and in that exhibition, they looked at uh, European modern architecture and represented it to an American public as a kind of new style. Um, and this is a well-worn argument and debate that you'll get in your architecture history courses. But what the, the, the point that, that we wanted to make about this, or that I wanted to make about this was, is that there was a kind of dissenting voice um, inside this exhibition, uh, and that was Lewis Mumford, who was uh, brought in as a um, uh, uh, sort of um, you know, a organizer of it, but sort of got marginalized very, very early. What the exhibition largely looked at was European housing in the post-World War I period, uh, largely from Germany, 
um, Holland, Corbusier was there, so there was French housing, there was a few American examples, Frank Lloyd Wright was thrown in there for uh, complicated political reasons, but mostly these architecture historians and um, uh, architecture uh, people like Johnson were looking at this public housing and th they presented it. These photographs were all done by a really important uh, architect, um, architecture sort of critic and um, urban uh, uh, planner, uh, Catherine Bauer, uh, who's sort of one of these really overlooked uh, figures. And she was sent over to Europe and photographed a lot of this housing. But the way that the architecture was presented in 1932 was in this very, I hate to say formal word, because it's such a loaded term, but uh, in, in, art, in the world of art, I think more specifically we could say formal. That is to say that it was presented without people, without cars, it's taken out of its context. There's the famous Fagus factory, it was in the exhibit. This is J.J.P. Oud's, one of his houses at Weisenhof Siedlung in uh, Stuttgart. Uh, um, can't remember. Th I think this is also the back of the JJP outhouses. I could be mistaken, but um, then there was a quick sort of uh, segue into the United States, and they showed what was going on in America, and then as a counterpoint showed Sunnyside Gardens, which was in Queens. So the whole uh, argument was um, made in this kind of very formal way where the architecture was pulled out of its social context. And Mumford was really furious about this. There was a big symposium at MoMA that the Goodyears and the Rockefellers attended. And uh, anecdotally, it said that uh, Mumford got up and said that all architects should be designing as if they designed for a communist government, meaning that they should have this kind of engagement with social uh, processes. And he was never invited back to MoMA ever again after that. But um, his whole argument was is that architecture comes out of this social milieu, the social dynamic, the social, sort of social program. And that's what architects needed to be looking at. Um, and we felt very strongly that in this kind of loaded debate between, as I said, formalism and sort of social practice, um, uh, we should take a position. We needed to take a position. It was last summer. I think all of us were felt extremely disappointed by um, all kinds of political uh, dealings with the Bush administration. And we kept arguing that this was going to be the first exhibition of the Obama presidency. Of course, we realized that we got the money for this from George Bush's State Department. But anyway, we were still sort of hoping uh, and making that, and I think the State Department is kind of un, they're not used to thinking in visual terms. They didn't really know what we were up to. Um, so we were kind of able to slide uh, you know, into this and, and get this exhibition proposed that tended to be, I think, very critical of some aspects of, uh, of the United States. So we, we felt we really wanted to take this position. I thought that in today's world, there's you know, two, at least two very strong sort of currents in, in contemporary architecture. Let's say the digital. Uh, at Pratt, we have faculty who are calling the architecture the new Baroque. That's the term for what they see the practice as being at Pratt. And um, that kind of um, a tendency was, was very strongly uh, demonstrated at the Biennale. And you'll see some of that uh, at the end of our, uh, ex uh, out of our talk today. And then, so we wanted to be over on to this other side of, of what, what I felt was the other really strong tendency um, in contemporary practice, which was, as I, I, you know, and the Architects newspaper have been incredibly impressed with what Dean Robbins is doing here in um, Syracuse. And that kind of engagement of architecture with, with the city of Syracuse and that kind of engagement with real issues is the thing that we really wanted to uh, focus on in this exhibition. So um, we put the exhibit together. Teddy Cruz was very involved um, in the creation of this, as was uh, the architect Deborah Gans in New York. And we had the third uh, co-curator, Andy Sturm, from the uh, Park Foundation. Um, and we all kind of like had these groups that we felt very strongly about. And we kind of all threw them in together, had discussion and debate. And out of that, we picked 16 um, groups to feature. Now, 
One of the things that was uh, that, that Aaron Levy, who will speak in just a few moments, and I became very aware of is when we began to historicize this work, um, you know, to try to think about a precedent for it. I could point to the 1932 exhibition and Lewis Mumford's a dissenting voice in that exhibit. But beyond that, um, I think in, in part the MoMA uh, presentation of architecture was largely accepted um, by the profession. Um, Mumford uh, himself became increasingly marginalized, I think, in the debate. I mean, he even grew away from architecture. He was so uh, sort of uh, disillusioned with it, which is really a problem, I think, for a lot of people on that kind of social left side, you might say, of architecture. Um, and architects just kind of ran with uh, different versions of, of uh, sort of what I'd call formal architecture. But when we started to look back for precedents, it was really hard to um, find uh, a precedent for this kind of work. Now, and we, we wanted to do this in, uh, for the exhibition, which is now going to open at uh, Parsons School of Design in a couple weeks. Um, we began to thinking about who in the last uh, you know, 50 or 60 years really thought about architectural practice in a different kind of way. One of those practices were the uh, Eames, Charles and Ray Eames, who you see here, the husband and wife team in Los Angeles, who famously developed um, Bentwood out of a commission that they've got from the federal government uh, to uh, develop low-cost splints for wounded soldiers in World War II. And these are some of the products of that research that they did. So they set up this sort of research team. These were all shown in 1938 at the Organic Architecture Show at MoMA. But they developed a kind of architecture out of research. Uh, they were given a, a, a problem to solve. Um, and they sat down together with other people, including Gregory Ain and a number of the other uh, architects who become very important in Los Angeles later, and began to investigate this issue and came up with this um, idea of bending wood, which ultimately, of course, led to their famous uh, Bentwood furniture that we now see uh, at design research in stores all over the country. But that came out of this kind of thinking. And uh, one of the other practices, because we're really lost at thinking who we could think of, and I thought that this might be fun, because I'm guessing nobody in this audience knows what this building is. Does anybody have a clue? If you do, you're getting a better education than we're giving at Pratt. Anybody? Someone. <laughs> Who? No. It's, that's right, yeah. Good. <laughs> I'm really impressed, Mark. <laughs> this is Hassan Fati, who, um, uh, who was an incredible, arch you know, one of these incredible figures. Uh, Teddy likes to uh, talk about the uh, architects of Central and South America who were so badly neglected up here in the north. And this is another one of these kind of figures. He was, of course, Egyptian, was educated in France as a modernist, and went back to Egypt and created this spectacular um, village uh, for the poor of um, Cairo. But his kind of lifelong commitment to uh, building for this, uh, trying to solve this really deep uh, uh, social uh, problem of social inequality was another one of these kind of practices that we could point to. And then lastly, this is kind of ranges all over the map, it was another one of my obsessions, was uh, Ant Farm, who I would guess was probably here in Syracuse, I'll have to ask Chip Lord, but I'm sure they ended up here, who were a group of uh, contemporaries of Archigram and Super Studio in the United States. They were from Rice and Yale, um, Chip went to Tulane, and they kind of formed in the sort of maelstrom of late 60s uh, uh, architectural experimentation and really kind of moved away from any notion of architectural practice. One of the members uh, worked for um, Philip Johnson for a, long, for a few years, and they worked in offices but only to make money, and all their passion and all their work went into these kind of protests installation pieces they did, <coughs> excuse me, and that led, one of their last pieces was um, Media Burn that was done at the Cow Palace in San Francisco 
where they uh, charge through a wall of televisions with this incredible Cadillac, which is now owned by an archive in Kansas City, as a kind of pro, you know late 60s protest against media, uh, against the war in Vietnam and, and all kinds of uh, sort of political engagements. And in the middle, that's Doug Hall, who was a founder of TV TV, was one of the really early um, uh, video uh, groups in uh, California. And here he's present, uh, in, in, um, pretending to be John Kennedy. Uh, and he gives this speech in kind of thick uh, Boston accent. Uh, and then uh, as a preparation, and then they charge through the wall. You have to see the, the screen, to, to the video that they made of it to really understand it. But this notion of kind of um, um, anti-establishment uh, uh, sort of uh, a, approach to architectural practice that didn't care about building buildings, that really thought that, it, that their work would be sort of this incendiary uh, proposals and uh, museum exhibitions. And they really understood the art world. You know, they've kind of now, re since then, there's still uh, Doug Michaels da died a few years ago, sadly, but Chip Lord's still alive. He's the head of uh, media studies at UC Santa Cruz. He's really, or was, I guess he used to be, but he's really still engaged in that world of art. But his outlook, his view, is totally architectural. So these were the few groups that we could point to. And then the last thing I would say uh, before I pass this over to Aaron is that one of the things that I realized when we were in Venice and looking at some of the other work at the Biennale was is that there's a lot of European architecture, a lot of European-based architecture groups that are doing art, a, a bit like Ant Farm. Um, there's uh, architects that uh, engage with some of these social issues that work for municipalities um, and different groups, but there really is nothing quite like, I think, the kind of practices that are evolving in the United States that we were showing. I think of it as an American model of practice, a kind of contemporary American method. Because one of the things that I remember so clearly when, when Teddy first started, when I first started talking to Teddy about this was is that he said, you know, we really have to talk about the process of how this architecture is produced because otherwise it becomes aestheticized and it becomes an art object and that's not what we want. I mean, I'm, I think that it's important for a lot of architects to do that kind of work, but this work we were showing was trying not to be art in a sense. So many of the practices took from the world of art, they were inspired from uh, different art strategies, but they're really engaged right down in the community. And you'll really, you'll see that with Teddy's work, I think, very clearly. But this American method, I think, is something really quite new uh, and extraordinary in the way it's happening, and it's happening right now. So after Aaron talks a bit more about the um, Biennale, we'll go through some of these, all the, in fact, we'll go through all the 16 practices very quickly and show you who they are. If you want, we can give you their websites and you can look at their work a little bit further and look at these different ways of practicing architecture, which given the realities of our current uh, ec economy may be ways for you all to think about practicing architecture next year or the year after. Okay, Aaron? So I also want to just follow um, Bill in thanking Greg and, and Mark and of course John and, and Yutaka. Um, I also want to just say that, in a, in a certain sense, Bill and I feel like we've had an awkward reception for this project in the United States. And of course, it's the United States that we're representing in Venice. Um, so we're really grateful for the opportunity to, to really share it with you today. An exhibition can only do so much, and I think that's a really important way to begin. Uh, an exhibition can't necessarily change everything, but one of the things that it's so good at is enabling thought experiments. And in Venice, what we were trying to do in terms of that thought experiment was redefine the social. We were trying to look at 16 groups that throughout the United States, they're not really centered on the West Coast or East Coast. This was really important to us. Um, they're really trying to redefine the meaning of social space in our communities and in our neighborhoods. And we weren't really looking at them with the eye of organizing an exhibit as much as we were looking at, at their work with the idea of mobilizing uh, the people that were attending uh, the exhibit in Venice 
to kind of go home and do something in their own vein that learned from and borrowed from these examples, these projects. So we weren't so much arguing for a particular methodology of practice. We we're arguing for 16 different ways of practices, uh, 16 different ways of kind of um, being an architect, of working upon an expanded idea of architecture. And so in a certain sense, it wasn't so much about uh, the Biennale, it was what happens after the Biennale is over. And I think it's a very different trajectory than the way most curators and most people think about exhibitions. Usually it's centered around the display of cultural artifact or architectural models. Um, it's, it's centered around kind of a, a certain discourse of display and a, a display that's again centered around artifacts. And we were really interested in something different. We were interested in the ideas that these, these projects represent. Um, I'm going to kind of take you on, just like build it, I'm going to kind of take you on a further derivation. Um, we're going to swerve through uh, some historical images about the Biennale uh, and then come back, as Bill said, to some particular projects that we've shown. Uh, about 130,000 people come to the Biennale, at least the Architectural Biennale this past year. Uh, it sounds amazing. It sounds like you have this unbelievable opportunity to reach people and to start a dialogue with them. And for us, it was really key that the project be an intimate one, it, that it be informal, that it not feel uh, sometimes like the way a museum feels, that it feel much more dynamic and social and participatory in keeping with the projects that we were highlighting. Um, the reality is though that um, of those 130,000 people, very, very few will stay for more than five minutes. So in five minutes, you have to convey to them uh, a density of material and a richness and an amazing amount of uh, grassroots energies um, that are admittedly really hard to convey in such a short period of time. Um, the, the other thing that I could just say in passing is that, um, I mean, it, it, in a way we were doing something that hasn't been done, I think, in the U.S. Pavilion before. We were, Slot Foundation as the presenting organization, we're a very grassroots organization, uh, and we were showing grassroots practices. The U.S. Pavilion, especially in, in art years, uh, isn't usually used uh, for that sort of sensibility. It's usually not a grassroots sensibility that represents the United, the United States. And so we really felt that this was an amazing honor, but also an amazing challenge. Uh, we were showing 16 of the most difficult sites in America, some 16 of the most difficult uh, territories, uh, communities, uh, and we'll show you those later. Uh, communities that have been ravaged by tornadoes or by socioeconomic issues, by the lack of public infrastructure or plumbing. And we were trying to represent the most difficult face of America, in a way, a face of America that shows how it's failed. And then we were also trying to show 16 amazing attempts on the grassroots bottoms up level um, to kind of mitigate the severity of those problems. So it's very different than uh, last night's presentation where there's more of a top down approach that's being presented. We were really espousing something bottom up. Even if we wanted the exhibit to be about kind of ideas, it's nevertheless one that immediately is about spectacle and about display. Uh, we kind of felt proud that we were able to have the State Department speak uh, in front of the most trafficked border in the world that Teddy will speak to his work along Tijuana. Um, Venice is, I like to think of it as like a theater garden. It's amazingly theatrical and it's marked by pageantry and an American sometimes has trouble accepting how marked that is. Uh, it's, it's a city of conspicuous display. Uh, this is um, um, the Storica Regatta, the Regatta Storica. It's a historical race, a pageant, a recreation of, of um, earlier races uh, that coursed through uh, the Grand Canal just, um, just days before the opening of Venice. It gives you a sense of what Venice is like if you haven't been there. And I just want to call your attention right away to the facades. The facades are so crucial to Venice, and you'll see how that reproduces itself in our exhibit with Teddy's piece. Carnival, which is actually going on this week in Venice, is also something that calls to mind this spectacularity, this theatricality, the way that economics joins forces with culture in, uh, in this, this very visible display. Uh, and then there's Pinot's Foundation, a very prestigious collection of art that's moving to Venice and, and they're renovating it. It's going to open this year and, uh, to coincide with, with the Biennale. Um, Venice is it's so much about the display of wealth and that's not something new. That's something that's historically always been, again, located in the facades of Venice. Uh, today what's quite interesting is you see that taking a more commercial turn with cultures of advertising. Uh, some of you have been to, who have been to Venice will recognize this as the Ponte di Sospiri. It's a bridge, the Bridge of Sighs. Uh, this year it was decked out in car advertisements for Lancia. 
uh, a sponsor who was sponsoring the, the renovation of a historical building next door. So you kind of see how the facade is always used in Venice, uh, to, again, to show wealth, spectacularity. Uh, politics is also something quite crucial to the Biennale. We tend to think in America of culture and architecture as being something removed from the political, it's maybe not always every time ideological. Um, Venice is kind of proves that to not necessarily be the case. Uh, in 68, of course, there were protests in Venice as there were everywhere else. Um, this year, coinciding with the private opening, the press opening, uh, the Lega Nord, a far-right party in Italy, as they often do, protested right at the, at the entrance on Via Garibaldi to the Biennale. Um, so politics is always to be located not just in the exhibits, but in the very context of Venice, in the, in the site in which, in which uh, the Biennale takes place. And as I said before, it's, it's, it's really productive to think of the theater garden model. Uh, the Biennale, the national pavilions, are for the most part housed within a garden. Uh, so it's, it's quite clear uh, when you start to work there that um, um, economics, uh, tourism, nation-state representation, um, culture, these, these are all joining forces in this peculiar thing called the Biennale. In 2003, and this is just one uh, image I think is quite important, Hans Hacke, uh, an art, a German artist, um, who's done a remarkable series of installations that analyze institutions and kind of, it's, it's, he's often referred to as an artist who does institutional critique. Um, he did a project that looked at uh, Mussolini's invitation to Hitler in 1934 uh, during the Biennale that year. Uh, Mussolini invited Hitler to Venice and um, uh, the story, at least in the German press at the time, in the newspapers in Berlin, was that Venice opened its arms with black shirts and with waving hands to, to Hitler. Um, politics, again, always has a role to play in the Biennale, and we shouldn't forget that we had this very peculiar role to play. We were representing the United States, so as much as we were representing grassroots sensibilities, they were also representing the nation state. And uh, so Hans Hacke, in his project in 2003, had um, kind of reduced the German pavilion to rubble. The ceiling, he had effectively, it looked like it had collapsed. The building had collapsed in on itself, and there were shards. Um, on the floor, um, and then he also called attention to this visit, the complicated relationship that culture and architecture has to the state. Uh, in the 70s, in the mid-70s, uh, the Architecture Biennale hadn't yet started. The, as, as Bill is alluding to, uh, the Architecture Biennale is more recent. Uh, about 20-odd years ago, uh, there was a split, and architecture, which had previously been incorporated into the, the Biennale in general, uh, kind of developed its own arena on alternating years. Um, so in the mid-70s, uh, before that, that split had taken place, uh, uh, the theme had been the nature of art. And for that, um, for that year, for that Biennale, there were an amazing amount of experimental dispositions that you saw. And I want to show these because it really gives you a sense of the long history of experimentation, cultural and architectural, that you find in the Biennale. Uh, Saul Witt, who many of you know recently passed away, um, in the Italian pavilion, he was invited to do a series of wall drawings. Uh, he brought horses in, in keeping with that theme. I'm going to go through these very quickly. Bill, Love, this, is, this is a project I learned of through him. Menashe Kaddishman, an Israeli artist, brought in uh, sheep. These sheep were brought through Venice, through uh, the city, all the way into the, the Israeli pavilion. Uh, there was a project for the biological liberation of 10,000 butterflies in San Marco. So you can see the scale, the, not just the experimentalism, but also the scale, the spectacle that each of these projects aspires to. Uh, and then the living theater, uh, you may know of them, those of you that are coming more from the, the visual arts and from theater, from drama, uh, they define the city itself as their space, as their site, not a national pavilion. So, uh, about two months before we opened on September 14th, the, the, the first day of the Biennale, um, we found out that we had received the commission. And so we had really two months, I don't want to dwell on this too much, it's more interesting to curators maybe than you guys, but um, we had two months to raise almost $400,000, which for uh, Bill and I was not that easy. And, um, and then we also had two months to work in a very collaborative way, as I said, in keeping with the projects. Uh, Bill and I and Andy as curators, but also with Teddy and Debbie Gans, who had also helped to write the initial proposal, who had been there from the very beginning, conceiving of, of the project with us. Um, we had to collaboratively, not individually, not quickly, but through 
kind of dissensus, through discussion, through debate, through disagreement. We had to figure out what to do. Um, and we had this general idea that, that you'll learn more about in just a few, but, um, but we had to figure out how to turn that into an actual exhibit. And um, I mean, that wasn't the only problem. I mean, as you guys know, Venice is a, is a floating city, so to speak. And so everything has to come in by water. And it sounds kind of easy, you just put it on a barge, but, um, but it's not that easy at all. These were our crates. Um, they had to ship out um, um, a few weeks before. Um, Venice closes down for August. It, there's a holiday called Ferragosto. It's kind of like our Christmas. And everybody empties out of Venice. No contractors are there, nobody. And so we lost one of our months, one of our two months to that holiday. So we had this almost impossible scenario. And um, so that may not be so um, important to those that saw the exhibit, but it was important to us. It very much uh, created an environment that put restrictions on, on um, how much time we had to consider everything. Even our vegetable garden that you'll see pictures of and that you've seen pictures of in the scrolling images before, um, even the vegetables had to um, come from the Lido. They had to come on boat. They had to be grown. Um, and then here you see Teddy Cruz's banner, that, that whole, the scrim, the research that, that he contributed. Uh, you'll you'll um, see more of that in his presentation. But here you see it going up. And nothing is simple in Venice. So there were about 10 people just involved in that, in that one part. And again, I mean, I've already alluded to this, but we really saw the exhibit as a social space, as a space that wouldn't just be about display, about consumption of imagery. Um, but that would be kind of a space where you would sit, you would debate, you would hang out. Um, and to varying degrees, uh, maybe we can talk about this later, to some, in some senses maybe it didn't work as well as planned. We had blogs uh, in the rotunda, we had lounges and seating throughout. Um, and in a certain respect, I think it worked very well. Um, in other respects, I mean, it's, it's very difficult to turn a museological space into a dynamic and participatory space. But it was something that we very much tried to do and wanted to do. And so I'm just going to close here um, before turning it back to Bill with just some images of that, of that installation. At night, there was this amazing translucency. So you could see through Teddy's research that was, in a way, the introduction to the exhibition, a piece, but also the entry point uh, into the vegetable garden and into the pavilion. And for the first time, we opened all the doors to the, to the pavilion. So all three doors were entry points and exit points. It's a really small gesture, but it was one that hadn't been done necessarily before. There was always one way to enter the exhibit, one way to exit. So the whole idea that you could chart your own course um, was not necessarily the case in the past. And the signs were made by, we'll talk about this in a bit, but uh, by the, the, the students at um, Edible Schoolyard in Berkeley and by um, the students of Yale Sustainable Food Project. These are the key words that as we were working as curators, we were trying to think the exhibition through. And then we'll go in, as I said, to each of these projects in just a few minutes. What we thought we would do is just take you quick, very quickly uh, through these six, 15 different practices, because Teddy will speak for himself, uh, so you can get a sense of the range of uh, practices in the uh, exhibition. Uh, the first one of the groups is uh, Center for Land Use Interpretation, who are uh, famously look at uh, underutilized, disused sites uh, in the United States, areas that we don't want to often look at. This is a kind of analysis of where garbage and refuge, refuge goes in Los Angeles, how much of our infrastructure is made up of uh, you know, taking care of that one aspect of life. So they're a kind of group, interdisciplinary group, one would say, with an architectural view, but also a humanities view, um, and also somewhat utilize issues of presentation since they have a space in their headquarters in Culver City. And they have a house in Troy, New York now, where they just did a wonderful exhibit called Up the River that looked at brownfield sites on the Hudson River, all the way up the river. It's an incredible exhibition. So this is their exhibit in Los Angeles, the Bradley Waste Transfer Station, largest in the world. They also give these very <coughs> elaborate tours 
of these sites, and that's they see as a, a critical part of their practice, where they spend a whole day, they take people through these different sites, they work very, very hard at it, but it's all part of a uh, kind of uh, expl explanatory uh, way of looking at their work. So that Center for Land Use Interpretation. One of the uh, younger groups from New York, I don't know, Mark, if you've ever had a cup up here at, uh, you know, they've been here. So some of you may know them, the Center for Urban Pedagogy in Brooklyn, uh, who uh, were an urban designer and a, uh, a planner. Uh, one of them's now the head urban designer for Newark, but at the time, uh, sort of came to New York, tried to figure out what they were going to do. They didn't want to work on a bureaucratic institutional level, so started taking on different kinds of projects. They did exhibitions on Fulton Street in Brooklyn and, and uh, store windows. This was a project where they worked with Bushwick High School. It's called Follow the Money Trail, and they showed the kids in this uh, public school who owned their landscape. So they're looking at, that's a little model that we use of these different uh, types of, of Brooklyn landscape, and they had a kind of button that would push and these arrows would go to it and show the students who financed and therefore who controlled that part of their landscape in their neighborhood. So that's CUP. This is one of these uh, diagrams. We had a number of different diagrams, as you would imagine, in these kind of practices. There's a lot of explan explanation about how the process itself actually works, and you see the different ways in which these architect planners, urban designers think of their practice. Exhibitions, education, community partnerships, media projects. Um, there were two projects, uh, mostly brought in by Andy Sturm from the park, was at the Park Foundation then, from Detroit. This is called Heidelberg, a really interesting artist named Tyree Guyton who went back to his hometown, I think after v Vietnam War. And, uh, was looking at these, you know, the urban problems and decided to make Detroit his palette, and particularly this one street that he uh, lived on, uh, which was abandoned, and he, you know, used thrown away <coughs> products to sort of enliven the street, brought in young kids in the neighborhood to work with him, held um, art exhibitions on the street. So he's not an architect, but someone in, engaged in this kind of interesting way with, with uh, social space, community space. Um, the other uh, project, sort of in, in a way in this vein, uh, comes from Houston. It's called Project Row House, and it was a neighborhood on the periphery of the Central Business District that uh, an artist, uh, Rick Lowe, felt was being uh, disinvested in, in one of these kind of ways that we all know about in America, where it was an official neglect, kind of unofficial neglect, uh, where the city was allowing the town, the housing in the neighborhood to just be abandoned and burned down, but it happened to be the site of the first African-American settlement in uh, Houston, and Rick felt that it was therefore historically important and a place worth saving. Um, so uh, he sort of dedicated, his, as an artist, his palette has become uh, this neighborhood. Um, this is a group called Rebar that's landscape architects um, and planners and urban designers from San Francisco. And they uh, have done some really kind of interesting projects that again cross between uh, landscape, architecture, uh, and the world of art. They were commissioned by the Burning Man Group to do a movable um, exhibition pavilion in San Francisco, and this is in the panhandle. So they entered a competition, they won. It's built out of, those are old Coca-Cola bottles that are the back of the stage, which are sound uh, insulators. The top's made out of car hoods from automobiles, and the bottom are old doors that they found. So it's a totally recyclable uh, stage that's moved every year. And I'm hoping to sort of bring it to New York next year and set it up in the city. Okay. Okay. So this is the work of, um, this is a, a FEMA photograph that was taken in 2007. Uh, just after a cat the equivalent of a Category 5 tornado had uh, taken out Greensburg, Kansas. And um, it communicates uh, one of the things that united all of the groups in the exhibit, which was urgency and need. Um, these groups aren't really into high bandwidth um, architecture. They're not into um, algorithms and parametric equations. They're often so invested in working with communities, each in their own way, um, that they don't even take the time to document their work. Uh, which is something that we could talk about maybe later, the difficulty of showing these architects 
in a way that's true to their practice when there's almost no documentation models to, to seek out, to find. In any event, um, Studio 804, it's a program affiliated with the University of Kansas. Uh, Dan Rockhill uh, over, uh, runs it. Um, they um, defined this as one of their communities, as one of their sites. They wanted to build the first building after this uh, destruction had happened. Uh, so they went into the community, uh, the students and Dan, and they asked the community what they wanted, and the community said they wanted a cultural center. Uh, and so they built the first building in that town. It's, um, this photograph doesn't do justice to it. It kind of um, removes it from the, the, the context and the site. Um, but um, in any event, what's, what's pretty remarkable is it's the highest, um, it has the highest lead status of any building in Kansas at that time. Uh, the wood that you see behind the glass is um, uh, wood taken from a decommissioned munitions factory. Um, and it actually, the walls unfold and let in kind of um, wind um, throughout the day, depending on the, on the weather, the temperature. It's a really amazing structure. Um, elsewhere in Kansas, they've worked in communities that haven't seen new development, new houses in over 30 years. Uh, so it's a really an amazing um, program. Uh, many of you probably know of Rural Studio, first begun by Samuel Maccabee, an artist uh, currently under the directorship of Andrew Freer. Uh, Rural Studio is it's an amazing program where students learn how to improvise. They get an undergrad degree uh, by building a structure. Initially, those were for individual families in need. Now it's also for municipal structures. Uh, they also devote their attention to the municipal arena. Um, in New Bern County and in Hale County, uh, sorry, in New Bern and in Hale County, um, in rural Alabama, uh, uh, families are three times as likely to not have any plumbing. Uh, um, half of them live in trailers. Um, there's uh, an enormous paucity of public infrastructure, to say the least. And uh, so that's the environment that they're working in. Uh, we, I went there with Debbie Gans to try to get some documentation uh, to represent them in Venice. And um, we got there, we had to hack into their computer. We found some files, but it wasn't really what we needed. But when we were there, we got some phone numbers for one of the students who had built this Hale County animal shelter. She was in California. She'd actually been working for Teddy. Um, she put us in touch with some of her other friends who had worked on that project when they were students there who were in Canada. And then it was from Canada that we ultimately got the material we needed. So that explains the arduousness with which we were able to, you know, by which we had to track down what we ultimately showed. Um, There's, again, a municipal structure. It's an animal shelter. It's built to satisfy, uh, a, an, at that time, unfilled, um, unmet municipal regulation that um, there be an animal kind of refuge in every town, in every um, um, kind of series of towns. And um, the judge in the town gave them the go-ahead. Um, we were interested in this amazing lamella trust that these students built with their own hands. Uh, we were also interested in the larger story. Uh, one, uh, two, the students had not just built an amazing building, they had built a social infrastructure. This is really, this is really important to us. They had built a way that the building could be maintained, the way that it could function, the way it could fund itself. Uh, not just to get it off the ground, to get it constructed, but also for it to f function as an animal shelter. We were also interested in the fact that it was empty. Currently, it's still unused. The judge that gave them the go-ahead gave them land next to a prison for humans. Um, the prison is being used, but the animal shelter isn't. Uh, at the end of the day, the judge would only allow it to be used to kill animals, to euthanize them. And so the, the students refused to let this building uh, be put to that use. So there's a complex story for each of these projects, and we're not, we don't have enough time to go into those details. But, um, but in each of these cases, it's not always a perfect ending. And we're hoping that the Biennale and the attention it brought to that project maybe helps to change things. Uh, very quickly, uh, Jonathan Kirschenfeld in, in New York uh, has often worked with underserved populations, the homeless and others. Uh, in this project, he was commissioned by the Neptune Foundation to devise a portable infrastructure, uh, a, a portable pool. And it touches upon something that we probably have forgotten about. Historically, there were as many as 15 pools, floating pools, floating barges, that allowed underserved populations in tenements in New York uh, around the turn of the century to have access to recreational facilities. Uh, so he made this. Um, he re took a, a decommissioned barge and rehabilitated it. This is from 2007 when it was docking for the first time um, in Brooklyn. Uh, Debbie Gans, who we've both mentioned before, an uh, architect who specialized in refugee housing, 
uh, and research about those topics, um, uh, was commissioned to do a prototype in Venice um, for one of these uh, deployable structures. Uh, what she's interested in is not just the structure, but how it can be scaled to the level of a plan. Refugee camps are often informal. They often lack all sorts of infrastructure and resources. She was interested in how you could deploy and design an individual component that could be used however the family dictates, but could also be designed in a way that allows for it to scale well. Uh, Laura Kurgan uh, at the Spatial Information Design Lab in uh, New York, maybe she's one of the architects and designers who's most um, um, computational in her approach. She did an amazing project where she looked at uh, prisoner, uh, uh, sorry, the investment of funds in Brooklyn. Um, and what she noticed was that a million dollars are at times being spent on individual blocks in Brooklyn to send uh, individuals to prison, but nothing's being spent for the time when they come back to those communities. So she mapped out visually, she statistically spatial, she spatialized the data and kind of helped us to understand, again, these prisoner migration patterns. She then takes that research, that, that, that material, and she uses it as the basis for community um, organizing sessions uh, so that they can make demands, policy demands. Design Corps, uh, responding to uh, um, uh, migrant laborers in North Carolina, in Florida, uh, in Pennsylvania as well, migrant laborers that have no access, in this case, to bathhouses. So uh, Brian Bell and Design Corps developed, uh, again, a prototype and um, some prefabricated ideas for uh, bathhouses and, and modular housing that could uh, mitigate that, that severe lack. Edible Schoolyard, uh, the well-known American chef Alice Waters started this year's back turning a parking lot in Berkeley, California into a school garden. And the, the kids learn how to kind of become stewards of their environment, not just in terms of this particular garden, but towards the world in general. Uh, so we had that, as you saw in the pictures, in the, in the courtyard. Uh, they've also done projects with the Smithsonian. They really believe in advocating for slow food and for um, edible education, as they call it. And then finally, Keong Park. Uh, some of you may know him as the founder of the storefront uh, for art and architecture in New York. He's uh, nomadic, and we were interested in his nomadic trips and his uh, travels. Uh, he, uh, we asked him, we wanted to show one work of his. He came back and said, what I want actually to show is uh, the new Silk Road. And we were like, what's the new Silk Road? And what it is, is it's a kind of a recreation of the old Silk Road, which is this historic trade route through Central Asia, through, through, his, uh, through Asia. And so through his travels, he's documented each of the cities that he passes through, trying to organically study them. It's a different form of research than some of the others in the exhibit, but one that looks at uh, the hybrid identities and the effects of globalization. Um, so in a certain sense, with this one project, we were suggesting that indeed the United States is no longer to be found within the West and the East Coast. It's something much more hybrid uh, and international today, where, where our identities are implicated uh, within this international scene. And um, I don't know, Bill, do you want to just, um, maybe we can close by just, yeah, OK. These are just some of the other projects that maybe in the Q&A we can critique or uh, speak to. Uh, Zahadid, Greg Lynn, um, Diller and Scofidio's project about Venice, and uh, Estonia's contribution, a, a gas pipe, um, a Gazprom <coughs> sort of reference. So those were some of the other projects that contextualize our, our social uh, argument. Thanks. Thank you, Aaron and Bill. I'd like to introduce Teddy Cruz. He's an award-winning architectural designer whose practice operates on the border between San Diego and Tijuana. It often celebrates neighborhood developments along the border as important sites of transgression, negotiation, and collaboration. Estudio Teddy Cruz has received numerous awards, including various AIA San Diego awards, progressive architecture awards from Architecture Magazine, and the Architectural League of New York Young Architects Forum Award. His work has been featured in numerous publications, including the New York Times, 
Progressive Architecture, Log, Architectural Record, The Los Angeles Times, and Praxis. Petty previously taught design at SciArc and Woodbury University, and he currently teaches in the Public Culture and Urbanism program in the Visual Arts Department at UC San Diego. Please join me in welcoming Teddy Cruz. Yeah, um, <coughs> nice to figure this out. Uh, think, uh, you are really patient to to witness all this barrage of images, so I'm going to continue with the stories. Uh, but I wanted to, of course, thank uh, uh, you for inviting me, and it's so great to to uh, see uh, Mark Robbins again. And I don't know if he, I guess he had to leave, or he's. Uh, uh, it's so great to see uh, Tim Murray and Renata uh, from Cornell, and to meet John, and of course Greg. So thank you so much for inviting us to to tell you this, um, to share with you these images and this thinking. Um, I'm just trying to get to. Uh, for a moment to locate here, I have problems with this. Um, I should also say that um, a couple of, uh, I don't know if to say disclaimers, but uh, what I want to show you, even though we've been lucky to uh, recently to be working on a series of projects uh, in Nicaragua, for example, in Hudson, New York, uh, very soon in Philadelphia uh, with the Slot Foundation, uh, it's not, it's semi-new work, and, and so in a sense it's for me more important to really share with you the drama of the territory where I've been working and practicing in the last years, and the, the, the couple of emblematic projects that have emerged from this process. This is more important for me to really ground some of the issues. The, the, the second point is that, is not to say that in this case I'm, uh, well, maybe as, uh, as Bill for a moment alluded, even though that was part of the conversation in the Biennale, is, is not to say that there is this antagonism to conditions of uh, the formal, or, or the art object, but if anything, it's just a question of how to radicalize those images against a, a new context, if I can call it that. And in that sense is that all of us, regardless of our practice or our predilection, whether formalist agendas or not, whether top down or bottom up, is really about how that work makes sense in, in, in understanding the conditions of power that have been inscribed in the territory. So the return to that context, to understand what shapes the territory is really what we were talking about in terms of telling the story of some of these uh, uh, projects. And, and, um, so uh, let's then uh, make sense then in, in, in that context to um, to just quickly, uh, because I, want, I have a, a variety of images. Again, Mark, I was saying it's important to, that this is not necessarily new work because even though we've been lucky with projects in Nicaragua and Hudson and other places, it's important to share with the students uh, the drama of these images from the border and the projects that have emblematically emerged from that observation. But it, it makes sense to, to quickly just go through that uh, 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 piece that we ended up calling uh, six, uh, radicalizing the local, uh, 60 linear miles of transborder conflict. And again, re uh, returning to this issue of uh, the, the need to, to reobserve all of us uh, practicing, thinking about these issues, to return to, to the territory, to observe the conditions, again, of power that have that have been inscribed in that territory to open the map uh, uh, to understand conflict possibly as a, device in, as, as a device, as a device, as an instrument to redefine or reposition ourselves. So that piece uh, primarily had to do, of course, it was an amazing opportunity to hang the border, right? One of the most contested dramatic borders in the world as a facade of the U.S. pavilion. It was an amazing treat just before the Bush administration ended. And, and uh, so you don't imagine what the, the, the ticos I felt when I saw the the cultural attaché of the American embassy inaugurating the, the pavilion and the border was in the back as, as a backdrop. Uh, but a, in a sense, it was really a, a, a photographic cross-section through the territory where I live and work, tangential to the border, in fact, 60 linear miles of conflict, picking up environments along its way, where uh, probably top-down at times or bottom-up uh, with the social networks of uh, community activism, top-down development and so on, collide. Natural ecologies, artificial ecologies, these moments of collision across the 60 linear miles, uh, beginning 30 miles deep into San Diego, ending 30 miles south into Tijuana. So let's imagine beginning, again, 30 miles deep into San Diego, some of the edges of, of San Diego where the topography is being destroyed as developers are in, 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 imposing these top-down uh, master plan gated communities. Uh, and then uh, moving 
of course, a conflict of top-down development and the topography moving into uh, the conflict between large infrastructure and the watershed. You can imagine in California, uh, as the freeways march you know, along the coastal cities, they collide with this network of watersheds, river ecologies, and these spaces beneath these environments is just incredibly dramatic. So this conflict between large infrastructure and the river ecology or the watershed, the conflict between gated communities and everyday life, or as my friend Rebecca Solden used to say, the apartheid of everyday life, uh, the conflict uh, between uh, military bases and environmental zones, ironically, in this very strange territory, the only places where there is no development, because as you can imagine from LA to San Diego is continuous development along the coast. The only places of interruption is where the military bases are found. And, and on top of it, they are overlaid with environmentally protected zones. So this conflict, very strange conflict between military, militarization and environmental protection. Uh, the conflict between the formal and the informal in the older neighborhoods of San Diego, I will talk about that in a moment. And of course, the border between these two cities that collide against each other as they juxtapose as well. And uh, deep now into San Diego, as soon as we cross the border, we realize that the checkpoint is exactly at the place where the river, the Tijuana River, crashes against the border wall, opening it up and then continuing into San Diego. So the conflict between the river and the border, the conflict between the informal and the natural ecologies as shanty towns encroach into these ecologies as well, the conflict between factories and emergency housing uh, deep south into, into Tijuana, and of course, the conflict between density and the sprawl as well across the border and just as the end of this section, the mother of all conflicts, the conflict between the natural and the political as the border finally sinks into the Pacific Ocean. And of course, as you zoom out, what you ended up seeing is the, 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 the panorama of that moment where the border, after traveling 18 miles of the Tijuana territory, finally, again, sinks into the Pacific Ocean. That's not a Photoshop, let's say, the people, the people this is exactly what I found that day. And in fact, uh, Keon Park uh, held me to take the photos, you know, the nomadic, uh, uh, the nomad. Uh, uh, out of this, of course, uh, uh, image, out of this image, uh, emerged an opportunity to, to basically, and let me, I have to really um, move to this uh, efficiently because I, I want to get to the images. Um, a question that is, again, the question that I would pose to all of you. What really motivates your practice? Uh, what is behind? What are the procedures that really are being shaped by our practices as we uh, confront these issues? Again, I, I, I make a disclaimer mark in the beginning that it's not that I'm against formalist agendas or aesthetic, aesthetic uh, practices, or uh, Bill mentioned that, or they are uh, object of, of art. But if anything, it's just a question, what radicalizes that work? How do we embed that work in the complex, complexity of the socioeconomic and political forces that are redefining our institutions? So the, 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 the diagram that came up, very simple diagram in a sense, uh, was to suggest that at least my practice, I was trying to put into a diagram this very direct, direct message, that my practice has been inspired, in fact, by facing conflict, by understanding that we really are in the midst of an amazing crisis of unprecedented magnitude. Crisis of environmental sustainability, crisis of public infrastructure, crisis of institutional collaborations, crisis of socioeconomic sustainability, of housing affordability, of political engagement, you call it. And this is, of course, this is happening in September when the, the world is burning out there and architects are discussing you know, uh, what to de how to deal with these issues. So as we face conflict, uh, and conflict becomes an operational device, let's say, to redefine or reposition practice. Uh, we would have to engage, of course, our, our practice with the research that we, is fundamental to expose conflict, to understand what are the issues, the conditions that have produced those collisions in the first place. I, I would put, I mean, in a more uh, lyrical imagine, uh, image, I would say that a lot of those in, uh, places that my 60 linear mile photographic cross section showed is in fact in those collisions, at those intersections where practice should position itself. Uh, so, exposing conflict as an operational tool implies tactics of translation. This is what I was maybe asking, of course, uh, uh, Sergio yesterday, even though I wouldn't expect that he would answer this, but this is uh, the role of the schools of architecture in helping to translate some of these amazing processes. But tactics of translation 
in exposing territorial power. What is it that really has built, what has constructed the territory in this sense? Two areas of interest of my practice have been conditions of ownership. Who owns the resources? That's the question that we would have to ask before we dump our buildings into the territory. Who owns the resources? Who owns those units? Who owns the, the, the resources? The other one is political jurisdiction. Whose territory is it? To expose against those conditions would suggest that we would have to right away understand that the fragmentation and the stupidity of planning behind the fragmentation of our city into these uh, atomized sort of bubbles uh, reflects the fragmentation of institutions. And that somehow the fragmented policies, the fragmented resources, and ultimately the fragmented budgets really need to be realigned and redistributed, reorganized, reconfigured by practice, by artistic practice. So the designing of the redistribution of resources and collaborations could be the, the material for architects as well to produce ultimately economic alternative economic performance, the, the developer spreadsheet that could ultimately suggest that a neighborhood could be a developer, alternative policy frameworks that could suggest that density can be understood different, differently, not as an amount of units per acre, but as an amount of social exchanges per acre, and spatial tactics, alternative spatial tactics, where in a kind of relational aesthetic sort of uh, way, form could anticipate social encounter. So this expanded model of practice and research that we are all searching, I think would suggest an act of mediation between the top-down and uh, the, um, f the, the sort of the top-down formal economic capital and, and the bottom-up informal social capital uh, is an important issue here, ultimately capturing hidden value. And this is a, the, the issue that has primarily been, been the inspiration for my practice. So let me dive right into the images because otherwise it will take me a long time to get to the point which is ultimately the tragedy of somebody coming from Latin America. Um, <laughs> so, so the practice, in a sense, has been oscillating between these two worlds, these two cities that are 20 minutes apart between the strategies of the informal in Tijuana and the, the, the politics of discriminating zoning in San Diego. And as I mentioned to you, there is no other place in the world, even though I like snow, kind of. I, I'm dying to go back to the 70 degrees weather. <laughs> but uh, uh, no other place in the world that we can find that. And then, again, in 60 linear miles, I find compressed some of the most uh, 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 dramatic issues at play in our debate at this moment uh, in terms of redefining our practices. And I'm talking about, of course, condensed or compressed in this territory. We find uh, the politics of surveillance of migration and labor the, uh, the, the, the kind of struggles or tensions between formal and informal urbanisms and economies, uh, the, uh, ultimately the, the politics the, of density and the sprawl, uh, uh, all com co again compressed in this territory uh, between these two cities. And of course, uh, across those conflicts that we find embedded in this territory, they are manifested ultimately uh, in this uh, border wall. Uh, and of course, in the deployment of this matrix of military session at this moment that has not stopped, I think even with the Obama administration. These are the pages uh, from Homeland Security explaining to the public the, the, the kind of um, distribution of these logics, let's say, um, uh, what is happening? Um, the image is not changing, please. Because I need to, I depend on the MTV effect of moving fast, you know, to, uh, let's see, it's, uh, I think it's uh, saving itself or something. Um, it, the issue is that uh, these images are very compelling, um, the Homeland Security website where you find an explanation uh, of the distribution of these systems, of paramilitary systems across the border at this moment. Um, I cannot believe it. Um, let me just get uh, to the image to change. The story flows with the, the images. No, it, it, I think that it is just. Uh, no, uh, no, no. So now, now, uh, uh oh. If you can. Uh, um, no. No, it would be, it's a, it's a huge, so don't, please uh, hang in there. Um, and without my images, I, I cannot tell you anything. Uh, 
so let me just, I think it has uh, to be. Uh, location of these unknown uh, lines or uh, of flow of immigrants, and imagine this in some of the military bases near San Diego in Camp Pendleton, the recreation of mock villages looking like Fallujah, so Fallu little Fallujah in San Diego where they project uh, holograms of Arab subjects moving for, us, uh, for soldiers to practice. So truly a kind of militarized zone that is intensified at the border, again, stopping this flow of migration. Seemingly this anti-terrorist agenda is still very much alive here, now neatly fused with an anti-immigration agenda that ultimately, of course, is manifested in a very much a kind of attitude towards the territory, a kind of lifestyle packaged, again, uh, in, that, in that kind of morale, and again, that is solidified in this border wall that transforms San Diego into the world's largest gated community. And what I'm suggesting is that in behind the hardening of this wall, we have been noticing, of course, the hardening of social legislature towards the city of public institution, an urbanism of fear that has con it continues to really shape these, these environments in San Diego. I'm interested in understanding also not only these conditions of power from the uh, top down, but also the acts of transgression, the transborder flows that are really summarized very quickly for you today in terms of a north to south, south to north uh, uh, flows, particularly uh, uh, two uh, flows that are of interest and of inspiration to me. North to south, the, the uh, amazing uh, flow of waste from San Diego into Tijuana. Uh, for example, small houses that are recuperated by Tijuana uh, developers who come to San Diego to save some of the old bungalows that are being demolished as developers are creating a kind of um, you know, luxury condos or McMansions uh, as developers are destroying the first ring of suburbanization in San Diego, some of those older neighborhoods to, to impose an inflated version of that. And these developers from Tijuana bring these small houses to the, borders, uh, to the border on wheels, so these are houses waiting to cross the border. As soon as they cross the border, they are put on top of those moment frames, those steel frames, leaving the space beneath open-ended for more house or for a small building, making the first floor the second. And this layering, again, of intensive, intensive sort of programmatic uh, just oppositions is what makes this city incredibly, incredibly radical. I don't want to dwell too much on many of the stories because there is so much to say, but this house was not imported from San Diego. It was built from scratch by its inhabitant who wanted to bring together his most two precious dreams, in a sense. A replica of a pink tract home from San Diego while maintaining his car repair shop beneath. I think this approximation of opposites is really what defines not only the poetic act, but so much a political uh, uh, pro uh, production of space. Uh, tires, as you have seen throughout ages, but look at what these people are doing to the tires. This inert object now has been uh, dismantled, uh, opened up, uh, looped, clipped, into, and interlocked into this more solid retaining wall. I mean, this is very much alive that in conditions of social emergency, creativity flourishes, right? This, this way of stitching these conditions to create systems that are more operational, so much part of the debate in our contemporary urbanism. And of course, pallet racks to constructing habitation, light infrastructure, and the most famous of them all, the garage doors from Riverside in Southern California that are transported en masse to Tijuana to constructing habitation, to construct housing. Uh, entire garage doors constructing these uh, uh, conditions. Of course, all of this is not only the image of the bricolage and the kind of self-made architecture that interested me here, but it's really the political economy that is at play in this recycling as well. And I want to make sure that I'm not really, uh, 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 how would I call it, reduced to a kind of the guy that is the bottom-up guy or the informal you know, architect. No, there is a, a, an amazing uh, socio-political and economic process at play here that is of interest to observe and to dismantle. Uh, and of course, uh, this is what is layering some of these uh, favelas or these uh, 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 informal urbanisms in the edges of Tijuana. And what I'm suggesting uh, is that as we return to the informal, as we at least are trying to understand it at this moment, let's hope that it's not the image of the informal what is of interest here, but the fundamental procedures behind it, the socioeconomic and political procedures that shape these environments could be translated again uh, into very interesting tactics of intervention in the official city. And of course, they, they bring with them a range of issues, including the aesthetic, nevertheless. Uh, and of course, not only what is important is this waste, but the import and exportation of symbols of progress is continue, continues to define the edge city everywhere in the world who was going to imagine, in fact, that the urban code of Southern California was really what was going to uh, uh, define the terms of any sprawl city in the world. This is what everybody wants, a Mac mansion, a huge Mac mansion on a huge private lot. 
uh, including Orange County, China. I don't know if you've seen some of these dramatic uh, images emerging you know, from China where developers, Chinese developers are building resorts outside Beijing in the shape of Southern California, Orange County uh, subdivisions, <laughs> including uh, the cheap stock and the cheap aluminum windows. Well, this is what is happening in the edges of Tijuana as well, or any Latin American city for that matter, where uh, now they out of the liberalization of the banking industry and of course of subsidies, private developers are catering to uh, people uh, buy, uh, buying uh, social housing and they are building thousands of little boxes in the shape of small uh, miniaturized replicas of, their southern, of the Southern California counterparts. These are mini master plan gated communities in the shape of social housing. I call them mini-me's because they are equipped with all the cliches from their San Diego counterparts again, but in miniature, 250 square feet uh, small houses, but with their front yards, with their micro setback, with a small uh, uh, backyard and so on. But in the last years, and this is a summary of what I wanted to just uh, offer uh, here because there are so many more compelling images about this, but this beige urbanism as is imported from San Diego has begun to be uh, dismantled as people now begin to occupy a front yard with a little shop or two houses down, a second floor, and a lot of this environment has become now, these master plan communities are beginning to now uh, turn into favelas, again, going back to this sort of more complex socioeconomic uh, fabric of exchanges. So isn't this what really has motivated a lot of our debate? Can architecture transform, whether digitally or not, but can it really mutate? And in this case, hopefully, not out of just formal uh, tricks, but in fact out of socioeconomic uh, contingencies. And this is something that for me is essential to notice here and whether architecture can become an infrastructure of ambiguity that can frame the non-conformity of these forces. I think it's an important issue. So imagine this, let's observe that. That's an unavoidable reality. What do we do with it? This is like wonderful Sergio. It's like, okay, what do we, how do we act in this uh, context? So for me it has always been important to understand that situation or that condition and then produce a conflict out of it, understand what is the most significant conflict. So in here, the condition that is uh, so dramatic is to imagine that the levy town, the kind of first ring of suburbanization of Southern California is being dismantled in the last 20, 30, 40 years. And its debris is moved 20 minutes south to build a new periphery or the new suburbs of Tijuana. And this is the recycling of levy town into the Tijuana's slum. So this is an emo the, cannot be <laughs> an image as, as dramatic as this in understanding. So the conflict uh, number one for me in the context of these conditions is the conflict between factories, uh, labor, uh, or ch factories and cheap labor. Oh my God, thank you. <laughs> I forgot, can you turn off the lights please? Yes, that's great, thank you. Oh, yes, I, I forgot, I was like, I don't want to see you, I want you to see me. <laughs> or you don't want to see me. I mean, uh, so the conflict between factories, labor, and emergency housing. See, yeah, the, the, we needed that contrast. Um, and of course, it's interesting to imagine that many of the maquiladoras in Tijuana, <laughs> you, don't, you don't need that, do you need that light? Are they filming this? They oh, okay, fine. Uh, uh, so uh, many of the maquiladoras in Tijuana are being placed in the middle uh, surrounded by these slums so that factories can borrow labor very easily from these environments. And so the equation that we began to realize is, okay, let's not go to the slums as an architect would want to immediately go with uh, his or her tools. Let's go to the factory. That's a place of negotiation because these factories are not giving anything back to these communities. <sighs> no. Huh? No, it froze again. You can see that I... I'm sorry, um, let's see, because there is still a lot to, I cannot believe this. Give me a moment, please. Oh no. Uh, 
I should be able to, as I'm waiting for the images, you know, to entertain you, but I, I'm nervous about this, uh, and I'm, I don't want to, this to occur again, so I'm trying to see whether I should quickly save it once it goes back, and probably because I didn't save, I had to change a couple of images, and I didn't save it. Um, come on. Um, okay, good. It's going to move into another, another one, and... And let me just do this for a moment. I'm going to escape. This is good to narrativize what I'm doing so you get entertained. And I'm going to quickly uh, save it. Uh, maybe that's what is happening. One moment. Okay. I'm going to save it. Uh, Important to this issue is, again, the architect, in this case, uh, acting as a mediator or facilitator of these triangulations across institutions, across community activism, government, to produce a very different terrain, let's say, of opportunity in terms of realigning or distributing these resources. I think that was an important issue. I think a couple of people already have mentioned it. Um, no advances in design in this, ca in this case can occur without advances in some of these uh, political frameworks and, and economic frameworks. And of course, there is no other moment in history like the one that we are mo uh, like living at this moment where everything is up for grabs, where all the, ru all the recipes failed. And now we have to reinvent some institutions. I think what an amazing opportunity for all of us to have something to say, uh, I think, about that. Um, and it Okay, so as factories uh, get cheap labor from these slums around them, the question is simple. Can these factories give something back to these communities out of their own production systems, assembly lines, uh, in the shape of micro-infrastructures? Can we design or retrofit or alter slightly the production assembly line and using the materials of the factory uh, to produce this? And so we negotiated with the Spanish maquiladora. We began with the Korean one, the Hyundai but ended up that the sh their chassis was way too heavy. So we went to a, a Spanish maquiladora that is huge in Tijuana called Meca Lux. And we went and, and met with the CEO and we convinced him out of uh, a colonizer's guilt uh, you know, to, to, to really engage this project. And he was able to allow us to enter the factory and look at all the array of systems that they have in order to produce this frame. Of course, uh, altering very slightly a frame that would then be deployed at a moment of uh, invasion of the land by uh, many of these uh, informal settlements and distributed at the time of invasion or probably after post-occupancy to, to retrofit some of these environments that are very precarious with structural stability. So the, the frame acting as a kind of hinge mechanism that would in fact uh, facilitate and negotiate some of these uh, recycling materials that are brought from San Diego into Tijuana. In essence, a kind of scaffold of sorts that could organize the, the, the kind of stitching of that waste in more coherent ways, uh, structurally speaking, because you can imagine that in the first uh, rainy season, uh, these environments are washed away because they are exactly on high-risk zones of floods and uh, the natural hydrology of, of these sites. Uh, so uh, ultimately, this uh, uh, alignment, let's say, or reorganization, some of these systems would uh, all, uh, uh, support what is already happening in these environments, this sort of layering uh, of waste and producing ultimately and housing urbanism, we can call it of waste, uh, as also community activists are involved in the redistribution again in, in, of these systems. So this is a kind of uh, portable new Babylon of sorts uh, uh, idea. Of course, many of these projects, while we are in fact building the first prototype with the, fa with the, with the factory, are emblematic of just suggesting how do we then negotiate across these entities to produce another idea, uh, again, of infrastructure? So as waste flows southbound, people go north searching for dollars. And really, that's probably a, a, an aspect of our practice that is most important. The, 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 the sort of the, the, the impact of immigration and the redefinition of the American neighborhood and the transformation of the physical fabric of so many of these older neighborhoods. And we've been documenting stories uh, of uh, transformation, of uh, encroachment, let's say, by immigrants in altering some of these spaces, and we are producing a series of videos about them. This one is called Levittown Retrofitted, Non-Conforming Buddha, which begins with this very simple, I mean, we, we, we've been trying to build very simple images, not really 
uh, interested in hi hiding the complexity of these issues into very complex diagramming that really be not, don't become operational. But in this case, uh, if we were to choose, uh, reproduce the land use maps of San Diego and Tijuana, which ultimately they do not exist, the most trafficked border in the world, and yet there is not one transnational or transborder border authority that really measures the, the politics, again, in terms of planning of both places. But if we were going to bring them together, the San Diego uh, larger swatches of color of uh, 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 land use would uh, collide with the high pixelation of Tijuana's uh, a, a mixed use of sort of um, intensive three-dimensional uh, zoning. And uh, we could argue that in the last 30, 40 years, that this high pixelation has begun to seep into San Diego, depositing, it, depositing itself in some of these older neighborhoods. So I'm interested in understanding how these environments really become laboratories, these older neighborhoods, to rethink some of these uh, conditions of agency and institution. Let's imagine that in the last years of incredible economic boom, which has, of course, come to an end, I have to throw many of these slides, uh, <laughs> uh, downtown was the main uh, place of intervention uh, out of a huge project of gentrification everywhere, becoming a, a bubble of wealth uh, out of CCDCs uh, and so on and tax revenue trickling down into, uh, of course, those environments only. And equally, the periphery has become extremely expensive out of the investment in large infrastructure that only is framing the development of these master plan communities and so on. So it's wealthy as well. The place that we have been ignoring all this time, I think, has been the mid-city, these older neighborhoods where, in fact, immigrants have been settling. And so this has become or have become the laboratories for our practice Understanding that, of course, again, as I mentioned, this probably was how they looked, these environments, this first ring of suburbanization, 30, 40, you know, post-war, these levy towns of uh, a kind of homogeneous fabric of uh, sameness. And in the last 30, 40 years, these environments have begun to be pixelated by difference, by non-conforming informal densities and economies as immigrants uh, uh, build an illegal granny flat in the back of a house or plug a, an informal economy in a garage including, in this case, the non-conforming Buddha, because in fact, it would have to be demolished because it encroaches into the front yard. And I'm talking about the story we're documenting of a small post-war bungalow house that has been transformed in the last 25 years into a Buddhist temple. And what occurs here is that as this Buddhist temple now becomes, not, I mean, not only the typological alterations of this house are important and interesting as an architect, but to understand that this Buddhist temple becomes an agency that facilitates socioeconomic exchanges and pedagogical exchanges. This has become a place of education, of economic entrepreneurship, and so on. And so this begins to challenge our very notions of density. I will explain that for a moment, in a moment. Uh, so can we imagine that if the first ring of suburbanization in many American cities have gone through this uh, path, can we then imagine that in the next 60, 100 years, the third, fourth, fifth ring of suburbanization will transform in the same manner so that the, now the Mac mansions being built in the periphery of, the, uh, of San Diego, 9,000 square feet houses for one couple in uh, 60 years will have to be retrofitted to accommodate difference into three units in a small, uh, in a small um, a, a business. Of course, that's already happening. I never thought this, this was supposed to be a kind of conceptual play on this uh, adaptation and transformation of environments, making the large selfish urbanism of San Diego uh, be transformed into, into by a small uh, you know, encro encroachment of programs, but it's already happening as the mortgage crisis forced people to begin to rent uh, McMansions into a, 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 a small unit. So we produced this piece recently called McMansion Retrofitted to play further with this idea, borrowing from the beautiful image of ArtiZoom uh, in the 60s, uh, and, and we call this non-stop sprawl, right? <laughs> the McMansion Retrofitted. And the, the suggestion here that is very important for me to, uh, to convey to you is that what I'm talking about is not the kind of bricolage again, presence of this chaotic informal aesthetics, but more about ownership. We need to redefine what we mean by property as the Mac mansions will eventually pixelate in terms of subdivision, but in terms of, again, uh, uh, co um, different ideas, again, of uh, private property. And uh, this mutation, let's say, of the large into the small Right? Uh, uh, as we imagine, again, this uh, selfish urbanism, uh, uh, the future, I think, of this urbanism in Southern California depends uh, on the transformation of the large into the small. But again, 
primary to this I wanted to convey very quickly is really re redefining conditions of ownership or, or of uh, property. Uh, the other uh, story that is being very compelling is the idea of the leftover space as it has become the site of the informal programs that emerge in uh, vacant sites all throughout Cal uh, Southern California and Tijuana. So this one again is called Compendium of Voice, a Chronology of an Invasion. Not by immigrants, by the way, but I'll tell you by a group of teenagers. Uh, and the map that we began with is erasing the city from San Diego and just leaving the leftover spaces where there are, whether they are watersheds, brown fields, <coughs> paper streets, easements, and so on. And of course, we get this uh, array of this sort of uh, archipelago of emptiness. Uh, but it's not only the physical nature of these environmental fragments. What is interesting here is to realize then that when we amplify that image, what is beneath this physical network of vacancy is a series of chunks of backward stupid policy that has actually uh, defined that, that emptiness. I'm talking about vacant lots, brownfields, setbacks, watersheds, uh, in terms of setbacks that are defined uh, 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 across them, uh, paper streets. I don't know if you know the concept of paper street. Uh, do, do, to some of you who are in planning. I mean, I'm telling you, all the conceptual material for an artist is in the code. <laughs> it's really rich with this very surreal uh, kind of definitions. Paper Street is a street that has, that was recorded by the municipality at some point when the planners were somewhere in downtown on a table with markers designing the city, and they produced this grid that was juxtaposed on the topography. And when the planners and the surveyors got to that place, they realized that that street couldn't be built because there is a topographic condition that uh, made it too expensive, so they was left alone. So it's a registered streets that were, were never built. So you can imagine the whole territory is filled with those voids that could become the site for a very different idea of public realm or intervention. So in this case, we began to suggest that we had to look at the leftover in San Diego in some ways but not as individual lot line, uh, uh, vacant lots, but as a network of emptiness. Every time that we zoomed into that archipelago, let's look at the islands in relationship to each other, and we were looking at that small diamond-shaped vacant site. And what we realized after looking at this space, not only let's not foc focus only on the formal or the physical, but let's look what is beneath it or next to it. We realized that next to that vacant lot, there was a, one of the most famous skateboard companies in the world shelter in this factory that was close to the neighborhood. I mean, close, I mean, the neighborhood really didn't realize that it was there. Next to it, there was a church where uh, artists, youth groups uh, would come and to collaborate, a pedestrian bridge, uh, another vacant lot, alleys, a middle school, another church, church with a senior center, Chicano Park. In other words, surrounding this archipelago of, of emptiness, there is a, an infrastructure of social and political and economic possibilities as this agency Agencies need to recognize each other and triangulate. So this relationship of the social and the formal, because also connotes the economic, is what really began to be obvious here. And we began to look at all these amazing pieces of this archipelago. This is a paper freeway. Imagine that. A freeway, a freeway that was never built, and it remained as a kind of empty canyon. Uh, but of course, all of these spaces are surrounded by paper streets that can be a, a reclaimed by artists or architects. In fact, you know how the process of reclaiming a paper street is called street vacation. And it's an actual a process by which a property owner can claim it as private property, but artists are away, of course, from those environments. And schools, elementary schools, are always against canyons surrounded by chain fences. Beneath them, there is a recycling center, and so on. The one that has been very interesting uh, for us, uh, as a kind of case study of this chronology of an invasion, is this place in the, in the intersection of freeways and uh, vacant sites and near the place where I live, near downtown San Diego. And the story is about a series of teenagers that one night, a few years ago, decided to invade this, this underpass, decided one day to go with shovels <laughs> and, and actually get to this uh, site, which is underneath this, this, uh, this underpass. And they began to dig. And one day, the police stopped them. I've been documenting this and interviewing them. The police stopped them. And they, they had already dug, and they were already building their mounds. And they, they stopped them. Uh, the, 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 the teenagers uh, got together. They began to understand how they were going to strategically really fight back. Uh, they ended up suing the city. Uh, they began to, the first thing that they did, this is exactly, I mean, out of their own mouth, is to understand the political framework in, in, that was imprinted in, at that very intersection when they began to dig. 
They were lucky because they didn't dig in Caltrans territory, which is what governs the freeway at a state level. If they had done that, they wouldn't be able to have, you know, to do this. The off-ramp was belonged to the city. They realized that they were in this intersection of Port Authority, Aeroport Authority. They were in this triangle of the Bermudas between two city council districts and uh, also along uh, the Pacific Coast Highway Review Board. So the ambiguity caused by this collision of different jurisdictions allowed them to really have a, a, a card to play. And they began to, again, understand that power, that political power imprinted in that territory. But now they began to, uh, as skaters, began to uh, contact city officials. They realized or, or researched who the city attorney was, who their city council was, what were the agencies involved in redefining what open space meant and the budgets uh, connected to them. They had to become an NGO in order to, that was the city told them, in order to negotiate. They had to create their own bylaws, their budgets. They had to get a lawyer. They uh, began to collaborate with other skateboarders at, across California. And this network of information that is always absent from us as architects and as artists became the material for these skateboarders to finally build their skateboard park under the freeway because they won the case and the city gave them this space for one cent a year. And now it has become one of the most interesting environments, uh, again, uh, suggesting that the public uh, domain can be very different. Um, in San Diego, of course, and let me just quickly see because I, I wanted to tell you this story, but I want, I want to make sure that I'm not um, uh, going uh, over time. Can I have a few more minutes? Uh, um, in San Diego, of course, the, the task has been to uh, uh, pixelate the large with the small, as I suggested. How do we encroach into the, the, the relentless sprawl uh, and, and baseness of this uh, wasteful, selfish urbanization? Of course, California, as you know, is the mother of this selfish, oil-hungry infrastructure uh, uh, that really constructs uh, that uh, territory. And for us, for us, it was important to suggest that no advances in environmental sustainability can be achieved without transforming the very policies that define that selfishness. Even if we want to uh, camouflage uh, these uh, uh, environments with the highest technology in terms of green practices, uh, uh, materials, and so on, uh, as long as we do not uh, completely uh, dismantle those, uh, the, the kind of conditions that produce these this, uh, uh, backward uh, policies, I think we are not going to advance, advance one bit. And of course, that suggests that as we continue to see uh, climate change just through the eyes of environmental crisis, we have to ground it particularly in a cultural crisis, the crisis of the institutions, and somehow our, our absence in engaging the public, the public debate about these issues, the kind of eco-literacy or pedagogy that, uh, of course, Sergio was talking about yesterday, and that the environmental degradation cannot be separate from political degradation and socioeconomic degradation. Uh, of course, the imprint of conflict, of political strife, cannot get more dramatic as these images from Darfur, where the landscape is charred physically uh, in front of us. And I've been thinking that, you know, constantly the first world only blames the third in that sense, in terms of these environments, but also the first world in the last years has produced its own scars that really are physical in conveying this conflict between the top down and the bottom up. I mean, I don't know, I don't know if you remember this image in the New York Times when. Uh, this huge crater for the foundations of this huge tower, typical development in China, and the only house that is standing out of the neighborhood that was demolished there is uh, this woman's house who said, no, you know, you're not going to do this to me and to my neighborhood. And she stood there until finally, of course, it was demolished. But uh, this, uh, this physical kind of figure or image is a very, uh, cannot get any more uh, revealing. Uh, and of course, in our own terms, for each of these glamorous mega wealthy projects of redevelopment every, in every downtown that up to now has come to a temporary stop was defined by also producing a project of marginalization, the service sector or the labor communities that were needed from Dubai to New York to China to build that uh, wealthy project. So this project of uh, marginalization. And that has been, of course, part of our work is understanding where those people live and how they, uh, what role they play in transforming uh, particular institutions and, and helping us to really understand further the triangulation between density, social networks, and ecological networks. Uh, what do we mean by housing? As now, of course, our cities are a levy town and steroids uh, everywhere. Uh, and part of our uh, effort, and this is to finalize with the other side of the coin from Tijuana and now in San Diego, is uh, the, the idea that uh, housing policy, uh, uh, that no advances, as I was mentioning to you, in housing design 
or housing affordability can be achieved without advances in housing policy and housing in lending uh, or the redefinition of property. Uh, the role of mediating agencies such as Casa Familiar, the, the nonprofit that I've been working with in the last six, seven years uh, in the neighborhood of San Isidro to try to build these two small pilot projects that finally uh, we are getting permits for to build next year. Uh, the idea that these the agencies can plug into housing in a very different programmatic, again, uh, um, framework to make those units more than just static units to own but to really uh, connect them to many other things. So what is density is always the issue here. And I will not tell you the story behind this workshop because it's too long, but nevertheless, the idea that density has been measured simply by this dry equation. This is the image of a previous Biennale, a room that was so handsome of models suggesting the density of Johannesburg, New York, Mumbai, models, right? This is the most avant-garde schools. Still reducing the, the idea of density and city making out of an equation, an amount of units per acre, an amount of people per acre, I kept thinking this is the first thing that we need to demolish. How do we represent the dynamics of these flows, of this invisibility, making, understanding the hidden value behind these uh, socioeconomic flows that we have not yet understood? Can density be measured by an amount of socioeconomic exchanges per acre? That was part of the idea as I've been un uh, understanding the value of these uh, a, a, a neighborhoods, and finally, out of these conditions, the conflict that was of essence here, I wanted to show you a conflict in Tijuana, and now a conflict in San Diego, is to realize that in the last uh, years of incredible construction boom in San Diego, out of luxury condos and franchises everywhere in the stadiums, uh, not one single house, affordable housing project was built in many of those disenfranchised communities that I showed you, these older neighborhoods, not one. And when we began to actually research on that, and my client and the nonprofit began, began to question this, we realized that for a developer, a private developer, which is really who run the show in this country, uh, out of absence, again, of government, that hopefully will, things will change as government reinvests in public infrastructure and so on. But for a private developer to make it profitable to do a housing project in many of these neighborhoods, this developer would have to be competitive in terms of tax credits. Well, tax credits had dried up right now, but nevertheless, tax credits and subsidies to be competitive. To be competitive, this project would have to be at least 50 units in density in many of these older neighborhoods. Well, guess what? 50 units are prohibited by zoning in these neighborhoods, creating this strange catch-22 between lending and zoning. And this is exactly the place of opportunity, the conflict between zoning and lending and how we as architects could pr produce probably design political process, design economic process to create very al alternative conditions of subsidy or of lending uh, out of uh, participation and so on. I should, I mean, this is one of the most important uh, uh, diagrams that I uh, have been actually, or at least images to, that I have to fabricate to talk to developers or to community activists, but the contrast, I, I will not explain it in its totality, but basically I'm talking about the, 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 power, the power of economic capital has being what defines development. And the seed of development in the city is always the power of economic capital. And I wish I could really go through, uh, I should not, I should not, you know, the, the, the definition of, of what makes a private developer, the top-down institution. Uh, maybe I should, I should just steal the time. Private development is market-owned. Well, we just found out that the market do, does not owe it all, right? Uh, private development is market-owned. Its economic framework is La, uh, large loans, individual profits. Its policy framework, in terms of the politics, of course, behind this, density is understood as a maximum amount of, of units and minimum amount of investment in public infrastructure. Its social framework, who, is the, who are we serving? The social framework, the owner, the, the dweller is a customer. Okay, this is a, a fundamental issue. And when we compare it to the power of social capital, which I'm telling you somehow in my romantic view of this, hopefully not so romantic because it's been presented to us, that in the future, new markets and new economies will emerge from within communities when so many of these recipes have failed. And we have to understand that we have been misunderstanding somehow the power of social capital, people's participation, people's sweat equity, willingness to coexist and to really uh, reframe uh, relationships within a neighborhood. So for a, for a community activist from the bottom up in a sense, but I'm not trying to polarize this by the way, it's always a mediation between these two environments. 
cultural and social value is also uh, has an, is an economic engine for a neighborhood. So for a community development, not a private development, is the neighborhood owns it, not the market. The economic framework, density equals a uh, maximum amount of social and economic exchanges per acre. The policy framework, density, oh no, sorry, the economic framework, microloans and the community profits. Policy framework, density equals maximum amount of social economic exchanges per acre. And finally, the, 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 the gist, or how do you say, the essence of all this uh, uh, research, of course, that is obvious to all of us, is that uh, the, 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 the owner, the dweller, is not a customer, generic customer, but a participant. That a, a, a neighborhood dweller can be a participant in the redistribution of profit and of, of, of resources. And of course, the fact that from these uh, conditions, uh, we could imagine that we as architects could design the micro policies, micro economies that could uh, in fact frame housing differently. I, I will not, uh, th this is a project that uh, we basically uh, are having working in San Isidro, uh, in this border neighborhood, where the first task was to in fact design this micro policy. My client told me, before you hold the pencil, I want to know how these projects will be sustainable economically and politically. So we had to design a macro policy that we presented to the planning department in San Diego seven years ago. And uh, we actually, uh, through time, finally the, 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 the city is with us. And the, 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 the micro policy basically uh, presents a new role for nonprofit organizations in these neighborhoods, presenting three tasks for these community-based agencies. One, that they become the think tanks within the neighborhood that they are given power to create information that is useful for the municipality. The first task is that the, the nonprofit would document all the illegal housing additions that have been built in these neighborhoods. Imagine that, imagine that to make visible the invisible, to legitimize this illegality by making these illegal housing additions official, and the city would authorize them. The second uh, task is that the city would give the nonprofit the power to become an informal city hall within the neighborhood. So a neighbor, a, a dweller can come to the NGO to look at information and to look at housing designs for that addition now that it can be replaced by a better project uh, that is uh, safer and so on. And the plans have been pre-authorized by the municipality. Imagine that simple idea, right? But the plans have been pre-authorized, allowing the owner to be participating in the final stages of the process. And in so doing, the owner becomes a micro developer, promising to build that, that unit. We forget that in these neighborhoods is where human resourcefulness is very much alive because this is where the labor sector uh, lives. And finally, the 50 unit subsidy loan is broken apart into micro loans that there are sprinkled throughout the neighborhood, uh, creating these opportunities to build affordable housing, not as a, in bulk, but in terms of smaller units that begin to incrementally fill a more horizontal density and so on. So this probably, probably is the, the main uh, image for me, this relationship of policy and design and the idea that designers for, for sure can design collaboration across these agencies uh, and these uh, institutions. And um, I will not go into the projects because, well, uh, you know, through this policy emerged these two projects that one is a senior housing uh, a project uh, uh, with a childcare and the other one is called living rooms at the border. But it suffices to say that uh, ultimately the idea uh, is to suggest that housing cannot continue to be seen just as uh, uh, units irresponsibly thrown in the landscape. That units can be related to other things and that units of housing primarily can become economic engines for a community as we plug into them. Socioeconomic and political, again, uh, uh, programs. I think what uh, 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 Sergio said yesterday about always, because, you know, it's not just public space on its own. It's public space uh, plugged with knowledge. Is, is not just culture, it's culture to produce entrepreneurship. It's always about this, it's obvious, right? I'm sorry, I'm telling you what is obvious, but ultimately this has been uh, what we've forgotten, and, and for me it's an important issue primarily now when we uh, have realized that many of the, the, much of the housing and mortgage crisis was produced because some people could not pay their loans, and we could not just perpetuate this American dream that everybody has to own a unit to suggest that you are free. I mean, ultimately, I think is to suggest uh, to produce this, the, 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 the insurance mechanisms as we redefine what collectivity means, co-op housing means, not maybe uh, in the context of the 60s, but maybe new ideas about property. That's what probably our work is centered right now.
in terms of producing alternative economic models. Thank you very much. Thank you, Aaron, Bill, and Teddy. Uh, if you'd like to join us up front, we'll open it up to audience questions. This yours? Yeah, this is mine, but this is yours. Mm. <coughs> is there another one of those over there? That's okay. That's okay. Don't worry about it. I'm okay. No, that's, that's an issue. Said. <laughs> well, I didn't want to take more time, but it's uh, so Before we open it up to the audience, I have just a quick, quick question uh, for all three of you. Um, it seems to me that you're using the conceptual model of top-down, bottom-up as the primary framework on which to hang a lot of this work. And I'm wondering, Relating uh, the projects that you've shown us to the work that Sergio Fajardo showed yesterday, it strikes me that a lot of the success of what he was doing was very top-down and still effective and empowering. And so might there not be a different model, a different way of kind of talking about a lot of the ambition of these projects? Well, he, um, I th got the other impression in a way. I mean, he talked about how he sort of laid the groundwork for that. I mean, I understand what you're saying. But I, th I think that um, there's, it's like a constellation in terms of architectural practice. And there's a lot of places where the 16 groups in our, <coughs> excuse me, pavilion can have a conversation with uh, other groups who might not be in that, uh, be so committed to this. In other words, there's a lot of points of discussion and it's really a, um, like an open field, I think. I mean, I really dream of like a, a biennale where these tendencies actually get together and confront each other and, you know, talk about uh, places of common interest. And um, because as Teddy said, you know, we don't can necessarily completely condemn this kind of formal way of thinking about architecture. That's what we're trained to do as architects, so we can't deny what our training is. It's just kind of the way that you put it to use. So I think there could be um, a lot of conversations that we could have with all kinds of different, uh, you know, parametric modeling kind of architects. You know, at the Biennale, there was uh, Patrick Schumacher read a manifesto of parametric modeling, which was supposed to be the new paradigm. Unfortunately, he announced that because it was in evolution, it wasn't open to discussion or critique. <laughs> so we, it was hard to have a conversation with them. And this is another thing that I'll let you know, Teddy go on. One of the things that Teddy and I all, and Aaron all noticed was is that a lot of uh, these, these sort of um, groups that are in that sort of camp were believing that parametric modeling, as Patrick said, can design everything from a doorknob to a city. They like to present themselves as the um, outsiders and that they're storming the barricades of contemporary practice when we saw something very different, you know? What, it, what is interesting is that, again, that not about uh, polarizing the debate in a sense, but what we noticed yesterday through Sergio's presentation, which is, again, a phenomenon that has been interesting to notice in, in Latin America. Again, I mentioned briefly yesterday in my question that for some reason Latin America has become probably the only sector almost en masse in the world where governments themselves are interested in looking at social networks in formal, uh, the informal sector as a device to redefine institutions outside or beyond, let's call it out of the rhetoric of so many other people, outside American style globalization. So it's something interesting that has been occurring, uh, whether through, again, the rhetoric of Chavez or the intelligence of Sergio or the, 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 the kind of malice of Evo Morales or the vision of, of Lula. 
and so on. It's an interesting condition, but, but basically somebody would, uh, would, would tell me, but wait a minute, also in the United States there is this sort of attention to social network where the Biennale was an intention to really, in fact, let's go and look for people that are redefining themselves by uh, entering into that realm. The difference is that in Latin America, it is the governments and their visions what are really uh, building this infrastructure. In the United States, it has not trickled up to the level of the government. And that's, so it's not about top, it's just that it, it is top down because there is a guy right there in an office saying this is what we should do and it's good for us and let's engage the, you know. But also it's bottom up. You saw the library allowing a, a, a microeconomic sort of framework and then the library in this massive kind of presence also played with the contrast of this other. So it's not about polarizing but many of these projects try to mediate across those scales and that's what is important. The problem with Schumacher and these people, I'm not against their artistic experimentation. This is what we should be flourishing out of this debate, not really condemning each other, is that when they were showing images in the Biennale of these lingerie shaped kind of projects and they presented that on top of a city, they opened a, a kind of worms that I would like to discuss because it's not just about artistic experimentation, it's knowing that that artistic experimentation could be a tool also to address social political realities. But they have not touched that. And, 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 and Jeffrey Kidner said, well, this is not open for criticism because he's almost like Art Nouveau in his early days, you know, whatever. And I said, well, also Art Nouveau depended on a political economy. So what are you saying? That artistic experimentation is, has been at the service of a Republican view of the world? And he said, yes. And so uh, the issue is this, is uh, of a neoliberal, you know. So again, the separation of artistic experimentation from the political economy or the kind of social uh, responsibility is really what is the critique here. It's not, to, not allowing artists to be artists. But I want to go back to John's question. I mean, in a certain sense, I think the projects that we selected flourish precisely because they can't be so easily scaled to a, a more widespread level. They, I mean, you're an exception. But many of these 16 groups uh, don't necessarily have a methodology that under an Obama administration could be deployed on a more massive level. They're, they're really attentive to the locale. And so, I don't know, so I'm, I'm not com completely convinced that, um, that, um, that these groups can really, um, in a way, deploy their practice again on a, on a much more widespread level. I mean, you would disagree with this? Um, I think both sides need to move. I mean, I get this you know, a notion from the split between planning and architecture, which happened in the 20s, and it just has never come back together again. But, and there's many um, architects who refuse to talk to planners as there are planners who think that architecture is just form and therefore um, irrelevant. In other words, architecture can't solve poverty. You need to give people jobs. That's what planning ended up with. But I think that there are enough people um, and maybe what Mark's trying to do in Syracuse is just one example that everybody knows where architects are engaging with the process of uh, actually, uh, you know, rebuilding the city and recommitting the city. I think we tried to show not everybody in our pavilion, but I think a lot of them would be willing to talk to parametric modelers. Why not? There's a lot that we could use from them or that, you know, they could learn from us. But I mean, Take a group like Rebar, right, yeah. who built this panhandle band shell. Yeah. I mean, this seemed like a specific intervention that yeah, they couldn't were, be yeah. reproduced endlessly across the country. Mm -hmm. And it seems the same way with Rural Studio. It's, a, it's an amazing improvisatory architecture. It would be great if we saw more of that, but it seems so specific to those individuals. And in some way, some of those projects are so specific to a particular locale, yeah. and it's true. It could be very difficult to think of Rural Studio operating at a larger scale, maybe of a kind of metropolitan scale, or maybe I would be wrong. Mm -hmm. But that's fine, they exist in that bracket. Uh, people like Ted Smith in San Diego, for example, uh, uh, had, has been proposing that architects should become developers of their own work, and that the site of intervention is a pro forma itself, the spreadsheet, uh, to really play with numbers and the, the, you know, the lending structures and so on. That could be transferred, I think. That could be transferred at other scales when, in fact, what we are doing in San Diego were eight architects can get together and realize that their services are equity for a loan and that together they can really buy a property and that they actually can set into motion a process. That, that, that empowering condition could really get to levels uh, really of, of effect and all the way to you know, all, all, all other scales, I think. But what, what is important to say here in the relationship or the comparison I made of Latin America and, and the United States is that as, as the grassroots or, or this sort of other scale 
has not trickled up to the government or has begun because we already saw that the whole presidential, presidential election could be made possible by tapping into that uh, uh, source, uh, that maybe it makes sense, and that's my story. Let's just locate the work in a very particular environment to understand uh, through that lens the issues and then incrementally begin to exert pressure on the, on the politicians. And now we have finally a city council member that is completely on board that is trying to make this a kind of policy. So, so, so it's different scales and different approaches, uh, again, uh, you know, that, that are produced. Yeah, yeah it, well, now I'm going to sound like you today. Uh, thanks so much, um, all of you, for the presentations today. Uh, and this may be in the nature of the question that was more kind of prologue than question. But it, but it seems to me, since we're in a, in a school of architecture, um, it's, it's good to touch on the luxury of a curriculum that's able actually to go through multiple modes of production. And so hopefully students are exposed to a, to a variety of ways of approaching community, technology, innovation at all scales. And so the difficulty that, that we have uh, talking across disciplines, even within our own very sort of s small sector of design disciplines, is something that we can begin to, uh, to bridge in schools of architecture so that students understand the economic, the policy aspects, the formal aspects, the technical aspects. I, I thought one of the strongest diagrams you showed was what the skateboarders had to go through to just build a little bit of terrain, or the fact that you've worked for seven years to get houses which were funded by the NEA seven years ago just off the ground now. Mm -hmm. But those are very good lessons. And so going back to Aaron's point about scale, I don't know. I, I used to think the critique for um, the rural studio was in 11 years it produced seven houses. Mm -hmm. On the other hand, it's emblematic of other ways of practicing, sure. just in the same way that Teddy's projects are emblematic of the ways in which we can think about the kind of complex nexus of forces and capital that go into building a project. So I guess now with a question, um, how do you see th these kinds of projects, both art projects, the notion of art as critical practice, translating into architectural education or broader goals for design education? I have a point of view. Go ahead. Yeah. Well, I mean, one of them, uh, one aspect would be to engage this process of translation. That there may, may, may be one studio every year that really goes, let's say, to Medellin. And instead of documenting the buildings as architectures, uh, the, the students really dig into the whole history of that process of negotiation, of really creating a kind of urban recipe that, that can be translatable in terms of policy, economic kind of transactions, participatory kind of practices with communities. I mean, th th those are the case stories that are built. Why are we, cannot, we don't have to reinvent the wheel. I mean, that's the issue that I have with Curitiba, is that Curitiba was so successful. And yet, every book about Curitiba just shows us the pictures of the final buildings. They never told us how Jamie Lerner negotiated with the Volvo company to retrofit their buses and to this, to really understand it as a process. And so that's one aspect. The other is, of course, not forcing, but, but really pushing the students to enter into the greedy, greediness of particular uh, sectors of conflict, uh, to look for them, and to allow, you know, to really uh, devise the process by which co that conflict can be resolved, understanding who the political actors are, and very grounded in very real scenarios, in a sense. So almost like bringing the community to the university. I think that uh, somebody like Andreas Corepa, the community activist that is the head of this, you know, or other people, would, would be amazing professors, but yet not, are not given the, the chance. So it's this, that, that, that to me is uh, one possi possible way of doing it. Just a reminder there, I think at least a third of the uh, 18 groups came out of universities. You know, design Build, Rural Studio, Studio 804, uh, Detroit Design Collaborative, they're all, you know, in different ways um, engaging, maybe it's not just for free labor, but they're using the, the pedagogy to, you know, create what they're doing. 
I mean, uh, this is slightly off, off topic, but Bill and I wrote an article recently for a magazine in London in which we argued that, just like Teddy's uh, argued tonight, that um, the economic downturn is like this unbelievable opportunity for the field. And I think it's for the field of art, not just for the field of architecture. Um, there's been like a rampant pre-professionalism that, from where I sit, has kind of decimated uh, a lot of academic kind of um, corridors and spaces. And maybe the economic downturn kind of uh, makes it more difficult to pursue that avenue so quickly. Um, and so it may be that in the end it's economics that dictates a different course, but, but um, I think we're seeing something begin to change. Teddy and I are just getting a project underway where we're kind of, I'm at least in my case, taking some of the lessons I learned from the Venice exhibit um, and we're trying to build something in Philadelphia on a city block. And um, it's an amazing process. We're trying to figure out what's the right way to involve the architecture schools in Philadelphia and the architecture students. So that at the end of the day, it isn't just that we're getting either some free labor or just having a studio that f for once in their few years in school kind of has a different, you know, a different arena as its arena of operation. So. I also, can I, can I just, uh, you know, this, this polarity again, or the, when you were talking about a school should be able to do everything. I mean, I remember Sayart in the old days, I was always beautiful about Michael Rotondi, you know, he, he, he was a choreographer of all these voices and he was a cacophony and the kind of debate that really made the school. What, what preoccupies me recently is that the differences are, are sheltered in, in almost their own gated communities, you know, the, within the school, the blob guys or the kind of socially, you know, preoccupied architects or, and so on, and they don't complicate uh, the, the conversation across them. Uh, I think that uh, what I would ask, for example, the people that are doing this sort of formalist, uh, let's say, blob-like, which I don't know if that is, that's a passe already term, but nevertheless this uh, uh, agenda, th it, that when they get to that scale of the city, that their work would get so much richer if they understood the complexity of those social networks or economic uh, networks to let that form really get to other, I mean, we're all in agreement that what has happened is that we, uh, want to insert architecture into into these uh, uh, um, other organizational types of processes. Uh, so on one hand, I would ask them to do that. In my case, I would do the same. And that's, I didn't show you the project, but I've been meditating about what are the formal attitudes that emerge from understanding the politics of, let's say, parcel parcelization of the city. You know, a lot of the projects in this neighborhood, in other words, the formal attitudes I began to research almost retroactively that begin by pixelating the parcel from a 5,000 square feet into smaller segments, and that the floor plate of a building could be of a dimension to allow a, a level of performance in suggesting other ac levels of accessibility or circulation. So in other words, there are formal attitudes. I'm an architect. I want to really enter into those, uh, uh, but I need to really be clear about it because I spend more time talking about the, the need for us to really enter into the social, social, social political frameworks, but that could be translatable, I think, uh, in terms of, uh, I mean, look at it, Los Angeles, I always give as an, as an example, the older neighborhoods uh, along Wishell Boulevard, they were all made of duplexes and fourplexes because they responded to a particular political economy, uh, older occupied land, loans, uh, and so on. So the size of a parcel, the, the size of a building respond to an economy. And that, that's what I'm saying, that the formal and the social, economic, and political need to be brought together instead of being polarized. And, and, and that, that is as a, as a responsibility for me and really clarifying what the forms that I'm pursuing, uh, uh, where do they derive from? I mean, recently we in, in San Isidro, uh, they, they have built a 400 unit project that they had an opportunity to partner with a developer and I went the other day with Andrea Scorepa, my client, the community activist, and she was really pissed because the developer who she partnered with sent her a bill, or at least just to sh show the, the, the bill that they, he was paying, he paid, I don't know how many thousands of dollars for people to, uh, the contractor to paint the units. And she said, if I had known, I could have rallied my community to paint that. So we began to think of post-occupancy types of uh, specialties that can produce labor, can produce jobs in a community. And so in, the, in San Isidro, we are thinking of this double economy, that the contractor would be one specialty that maybe produces these warehouses. And everything inside that is non-structural can be a post-occupancy type of agenda that would allow the community agency to, for, to produce jobs. So that already suggests a formal attitude between the, the large and the small. 
It's like what Alejandro Aravena is doing in Chile, is producing that type of contrast. The contractor doing this, leaving the space empty to allow the, the local economy to build the rest. And so, again, formal attitudes emerging from the understanding, intimate understanding of some of those economic uh, transactions. Aaron, I was really interested in your, your remark that you were taking. You wanted to take the lessons you learned from the Biennale and apply them. I mean, one of the things that I'd be interested in hearing you all reflect upon is the, the paradox of the Biennale system itself, and particularly in relationship to the, to the economy that Teddy has laid out in relationship to the, the need for the legitimization of a state-sponsored exhibit, um, the economy of the Biennale, um, the uh, exclusion, inclusion of the Biennale as a socio-architectonic um, um, reality. So I was just wondering if you could reflect upon that, perhaps paradox a little bit. Do you want to start? You should, that. Okay. Should, yeah. um, I mean, the Biennale is, is, is kind of a perversity in a way. It's, it's something that we <laughs> see multiplying right now throughout every major city. Uh, this uh, past summer, there was one that started in, in, in Poland. Uh, and you could, everybody in the room probably could name a city that now has one. I think Philadelphia is on track. <coughs> of mine is trying to start one there. And there's something very peculiar about that because what it means is that culture and architecture has become something deployable in the sense of it's like cultural diplomacy, at least at, at Venice. That's how it's often thought of. Um, and what I mean by this is um, I was at a cultural diplomacy conference in November in Paris, and there were all these diplomats in the room, all these U.S. ambassadors and prime ministers from other countries, and for them, it was just a matter of like figuring out what the right cultural product was to export. And so culture wasn't what we're talking about here. It wasn't in the realm of architecture, the most impossible processes of these choreographies of collaboration, as we call it. These incredibly complex negotiations about, between the public private sector, individuals, NGOs, city, city hall involved, and all of that. Um, instead, it's just like it's camera-ready product that you export. And so um, we couldn't challenge the Biennale. I mean, we're not necessarily um, trying to completely undermine it. But at the same time, that was a problematic that we were so attentive to. And so Teddy, from the very beginning, said, if you guys don't communicate with this exhibit, uh, with the design of the exhibit, if you don't communicate process, then you've kind of completely taken the wrong trajectory. Uh, there was Emiliano Gandolfi also that, uh, the, what, he was a co-curator with Aaron Besky uh, of the Italian Pavilion. And, it was a good counterpart uh, and filled, uh, filled up the Italian pavilion with all these 50 some experimental practices of, uh, across the world. Uh, but he uh, had a, uh, an idea that, which in a way is kind of uh, reductive for a moment, but nevertheless an idea of what is, what is the life of the Biennale after it's, it's gone. And, and, and uh, he had some groups, some community groups around Venice who could benefit from the waste you know, of, of, of all these uh, materials and so on. So I think that, I don't know if he was able to do it in the end, but there was an effort to really get all of that material uh, facilitated to, to, to get into the hands of these people. But the question uh, is ultimately one that Arjun Aparudai made when he came to San Diego, Tijuana for the Insight uh, cross-border project. He said any biennial, any art project that really engages the city in such massive way, uh, should question uh, uh, how this leaves a, a, an imprint, a kind of vestige, a trace that can be the seed for producing new institutions, new institutions or new agents. That's in a really interesting provocation that the, the interventions themselves could, when they leave, a kind of, again, post-occupancy type of attitude, leave a trace that is grabbed or, 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 or you know, uh, appropriated by uh, uh, communities of practice, uh, others, you know, to, to uh, allow that kind of evolution. I mean, Bill and I very much hope this actually has happened, but we donated pretty much our exhibit to this um, re-Biennale group that Teddy was alluding to, that um, in hope, hopefully for Birnbaum's upcoming Biennale, we'll recycle. The art Biennale. Yeah, we'll recycle the materials that we had displayed. Um, One thing that's sort of interesting is I think, I was just thinking about this when Teddy was showing his work, the amount of money that it costs for us to stage this, Teddy could build like a whole community in San Isidro. <laughs> That's true. Why did, did we think that? <laughs> I don't know. Just to uh, leave the, the, the pavilion empty. Yeah. And, uh, use the money. <laughs> That's what, uh, 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 what is his name? Se no, Serra, uh, Sierra, the artist, the Spanish artist. 
who, who in the previous Art Biennale, he chained the doors of the Spanish pavilion and didn't let anybody in unless you had a Spanish passport. <laughs> <laughs> it was empty inside. All the money went to. Um, no, but that's, that's a good question. What is the life after these events? Uh, well, we're supporting the economy of Venice, which is such a wonderful place, but a kind of hopeless city. It just lives off these biennales uh, like a zombie. We helped keep it going for another two years, another year. Well, the Arc Biennale actually opens in June of this year. But right, but right before the Architecture Biennale, there was the cinema um, festival. Uh, and there's also a musical now, Biennale. And so the Biennale has kind of become an umbrella for a whole series of disciplinary initiatives. Um, but I mean, when you look, at, look up Wikipedia, say, um, the population of Venice is, is far larger than what it actually is. Yeah. It, it, I mean, 20 only, years ago, it had 300,000 people, now it has 60. Yeah. And so when we said and this that, is like a huge industry for them. I mean, two months, in the two months of the Arctic Tribune, 130,000 tourists came just to see that. So you can understand how much it's an economic force for the city. Um, and it's almost at times when you're dealing with debt and all the other problems that we deal with, um, it's almost as if it seems like it's fundamentally for Venice an economic initiative. So. Yes. Question over there. I was going to, I was going to be over critical about that. Um, well, the question I have is really regarding um, the social ideas of architecture, which you guys have really been speaking on seems more feasible in uh, areas such as Latin America uh, rather than the U.S. because um, there seems to be an embedded need for the people here to create things that generate capital. Um, and I'm wondering how do we negotiate this, not, not, the, not, not the policies, but the mindset of the people um, and maybe try to get towards something that um, generates this social architecture that we've really been speaking on? Well, all 16 practices were in America. Were in America. Um, we wanted to actually show one of Teddy's projects in Central America, and the State Department wouldn't allow it. Um, the State Department commissions the Biennale, so these are Americans. I mean, I think that's the whole point that all of these groups, we just saw Teddy's lecture, as if you mean, we, by we you mean architects, it needs to come from the architect, I suppose, to have the uh, interest in wanting to find a space to um, negotiate with. There are plenty of them in the United States. There just has to be the will to do it. I mean, all these different people. You know, Jonathan Kirschenfeld, who did this swimming pool, he came up with the idea of doing the swimming pool himself. It took him 13 years to build it. He didn't even have a client. It was just his idea. He eventually found a client that supported it. Uh, but that, it took like four or five years to find a client for him. He just wanted to do that pool, you know, um, and gave up a lot. He told us he suffered a lot, actually, professionally, to have that kind of dedication to wanting to, you know, do this thing. But you were saying that we mean in society, you know, or? We are architects or society, you mean? I mean, how, how do you push these projects into, let's say, the suburbs of San Diego where Everybody wants to just live in a Big Mac mansion and not give a damn about the rest of the world, is that what? in a sense. I mean, that's, how do you convince somebody to change their lifestyle? That's a project. It's a, that's what, this is what I was saying, it's a cultural crisis. And it's not about imposing one reality on another, but to maybe produce uh, alternative you know, examples. And those examples cannot be produced in mass, but maybe can be produced in a small neighborhood. And if we build that example, it can suggest a very different idea and then incrementally might, that might trickle up. Uh, or now when we are being slapped on the face because of the energy crisis, we are really forced to really rethink the models and people begin to, to change their way of thinking. But, but in a way, a major, major aspect of the project is in fact that, that, how to encroach, how to enter into that discussion. I mean, maybe I'm misunderstanding the question, but I mean, I'm not, not speaking as an architect, speaking as a curator, every single project that I do presents an opportunity to reach out to someone. It, it happens on a very microscopic level, but, but that's, that's the means by which you kind of work towards something larger. Um, so uh, I don't know, with this project with, with Teddy in Philly, it's, it's one parcel, it's one small block in one of the most difficult neighborhoods in Philly. Um, there's no cultural organizations in this neighborhood. They're 
won't be for the foreseeable future unless we do this project. It, it's, it's three people right now, three different organizations coming together. We had a conference call this morning. And hopefully in a few years that project will come to be and there'll be others that'll come from that one. But it's just, you just do it on a very incremental level. So, at least in, in my case. Mm -hmm. um, and I know in the past you've uh, collaborated with uh, Mike Davis, uh, if I understand correctly. Yes. And, you know, as an architect, uh, I see a lot of research that's been organized graphically. Um, and my question is, in terms of your studio, how, how, how is that research done? Is, and, you know, how do collaborations of that nature uh, work or, or, you know, Basically, what's the process to, to this end product here? Well, uh, again, the, the, in it, uh, the collaboration with Ma Mike Davis has been more in terms of an ongoing conversation, uh, eating pizza at his house with his family and really talking about these issues and getting upset together and, and, and just really engaging you know, a kind of view, a kind of observation of, of these issues. But the, the research in the end is so ongoing, you know, it's not, it's not formalized into a particular way of doing. And, and, and in fact, that has been part of the question is, how do we design even in fact a, a way of working? Uh, and, and so in a sense, has been very organic. I mean, it's been years of just moving across these sectors, these environments that I showed and asking questions and so the research is not as formalized as it might seem, you know, in a sense it's been very visceral, it's been very much grounded on observation, uh, almost in the kind of intuitive intelligence that, that, that Sergio suggested yesterday. Uh, but uh, it's not just your thinking, it's really the way you are contaminated by the others, uh, and Mike Davis and Eyal Wiseman and, you know, uh, an array of people, you know, this collaboration uh, brings the issues to another level. I mean, so, so, you know, he's been more of a mentor in a sense. Actually, I, I wish I could, I mean, there was no time, but I uh, worked with him closely in, in transforming his garage, which is one of those mid-city mid neighborhoods, into his writing studio. And he ended up calling it uh, my little shanty, you know, because, <laughs> because he was really working with a loop in the, in the zone to produce a sleeping porch above the garage. And so we built it and, and, and it was really a lot of fun. Yes. Well, you are the patient, masochistic ones that stay there. Um, just to go back briefly to the discussion, um, comparing the, the parametric practices to these more social practices, I was wondering if anyone would care to comment on um, the use of the architectural image to communicate what your practice is doing to the profession, maybe sort of how it compares between those two groups. Um, the, the architectural image, how you're uh, representing your practice to the profession as a whole, how you're kind of ah. promoting yourself? Huh. Be being a less formal type of practice than the parametric type. Um, how do you mean? project yourself to? Is there a, a difficulty in communicating the kind of social aspects of what you're doing? Well, in, in the end, uh, uh, that's it's an, it's an interesting and strange question at the same time, but. Uh, I mean, there has not been a preoccupation necessarily on projecting. I mean, there are a lot of architects who really work on PR and they're really good at it in, in terms of pro producing an image that then is, is niched somewhere. And then, I mean, in my case, it's really ultimately just doing the work, you know, and, 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 and as, as pretentious as that, as that might sound, uh, and, and the work that evolved. And, and then it's just probably what we were doing made sense to someone who said, my God, we forgot that's really interesting. And so it's been just a, a kind of word of mouth situation. And, and, but the, there is something about representation in terms of projecting a message. I've been trying to slap my hand a little bit in terms of not get to levels of complexity. <coughs> in terms of, well, complexity, yes, but not in terms of the representation. In other words, I've been interested in a very naive type of image, like that land use pixelation that is not grounded in a scientific layering of some kind of parametric investigation or accuracy mathematically or otherwise. It's just an effect, a kind of impression that suggests a message that can be as, as persuasive to 
an academic to, uh, to a community activist or a neighborhood, a, a, a generic everyday person in a neighborhood. Do you see what I mean? So if anything, it has been a struggle to how to tell the story, how to tell the story because as much as I'm seduced by the hyper aestheticization of the diagram in schools, which has been important because in fact it has prompted us to understand the complexity that is layered in an, in an environment, but somehow it is stopped there and we hide beneath that complexity, we are hiding the procedures that can be empowering. And so for me, if there is something about the, an image would be that. Maybe I don't know if that does, probably maybe that does answer I that. I think also, you know, with, the, with something like the Biennale, I think it's very easy to be um, critical of a staged event like that. I mean, I think Aaron was trying to maybe suggest some of that with the images of Venice and how it's this kind of pageant all the time. You know, we spend an awful lot of money and at the end of the day, you could feel that it's wasted, I suppose. Um, and particularly when you look at what Teddy could do with $350,000, whatever it costs us to do this. But the thing about the Biennale is it's really a discussion, you know. So our whole pavilion was trying to present work, as I said earlier, that I felt was an American model to a European audience that had, they knew World Studio and a couple, and Teddy they know, they know a couple of the other projects, but a lot of the, the, the work, the other 14 practices were unknown in Europe and it becomes a kind of dialogue. Uh, Aaron mentioned it, we got a really, I think, positive reception from the European press. Uh, the American press totally ignored it, but uh, at the end of the day, you know, you spend all that money as a way of being part of, the, of a larger conversation. All the architect, you know, the opening couple days are just thousands of architects all coming in there arguing and a lot of people hated what we did, people liked what we did, they hated parametric modeling, you know, there was all kinds of discussions and debates. The Dutch, for instance, did something really interesting. They refused to have, a, in a sense, a pavilion this year because this very famous uh, school burned down uh, in Holland. Uh, that was part of their um, great sort of archive of architecture. And they thought, well, let's take this opportunity to rethink architecture at this moment. So rather than have a presentation of drawings on a wall or a model in the middle of a space, they held uh, open sessions of discussion and debate. You know, And that has to be great, fantastic. And I sort of feel like even with the internet you know, and the way we all want have these kind of discussions over the internet. There's something still incredibly powerful about being in a physical space and having a face-to-face -face discussion with someone else. And so at the end of the day, it sort of makes all of this effort that we put into it uh, worthwhile, you know, because there is a, a debate and a discussion about this. There are a lot of practices that practice like Teddy, but not quite, you know, they're not, I think, as far along in analyzing the real problem. And it's fantastic for them to hear Teddy and to see this kind of uh, work and, you know, who knows, something else might develop out of it. There are a lot of architecture students go to this too because you get to see everything. So it's a, uh, it's a really f an amazing, fantastic, I think, experience despite all the difficulty of having to do it. I think what Bill said is, is crucial, actually. It's, it's, it wouldn't make for an interesting Biennale if every pavilion had kind of the same sensibility that we did. It's precisely the heterogeneity that makes for the, the, the amazing conversations that take place. We, we need the Greg Lins, uh, the Zaha Hadid <laughs> seating in the Arsenal that you couldn't sit on because it was maybe <laughs> rumor it was that it had already been sold. Um, you need all of that to, to make that conversation possible. I mean, when you're a curator, when you organize a lecture series in Mark's case, and in John's case, um, you, you don't just invite the people that you like or the people that represent your viewpoint. You invite the people that will make for a, a real conversation to take place. Unless you work for a communist. <laughs> <laughs> and, 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 and I would say also, you know, it's not to say, well, on one hand is the heterogeneity in the diversity of voices and you are there witnessing all this range of issues. But I sometimes feel also it's about getting a little bit pissed off, okay? Yeah, uh, it is, yeah. Walking through the Arsenale. Uh, Aaron Besk is now that Mar Mark is gone, I can say this. Uh, <laughs> uh, working, uh, you know, uh, looking at Aaron Besk's Arsenale that I ended up labeling the longest uh, 
uh, boutique hotel lounge, <laughs> uh, because it was this installation after installation of architects. You know, Zaha Hadid with this contorted corporate and the largest, you know, most seductive lounge uh, to you call it. I mean, every uh, all these architects doing you making can't installations. Touch it. You weren't allowed to touch it. Hugely anything. expensive. Ninety percent of the budget went into letting architects do these installations. And as I'm walking there, I'm realizing the, bur the world is burning outside. And here are architects indulging in this sort of, uh, you know, possibility, right? And so, of course, you, would say, you know, it just gives you more ammunition. And no, you can, I can criticize them openly, but if anything, it just allows you to return to your place, you know, and work and keep working, you know, and to really get deeper into it. In but there's such issues. a strong expectation for entertainment in that arsenal. I mean, there's such a logic of spectacularity. Yeah. I mean, I completely agree it could have been put to far better use, and we would have loved to have been part of that. But, but there's also a logic to the Biennale, which is that pageantry. Um, I mean, and we participated in that. Your piece was a spectacular seduction that got people um, to, to focus on the border and then to pass through it and find this very sober pavilion at the end of the day. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, I don't know how you resist that spectacularity. It's really tricky. We, we also tried to open our pavilion up and make it you know, we had free internet wireless, which <laughs> doesn't seem Everybody that was important there. here, but in Venice, it's very hard to find, you know, the Guggenheim Museum doesn't even have internet for their work, or they don't <coughs> have wireless for their workers. So a lot of the other pavilions, Aaron and I'd walk around the day before, they wouldn't let us in because they, they, they didn't want to have us see it before it was like done. And we had the opposite approach, you know, come on in. So we told everybody we had free <coughs> wireless. So all the other curators were coming into the American Pavilion, and we had these discussions while we were putting it up, and um, we felt that it was, this has become a cliche for Aaron and I, the spirit of our pavilion, which is sort of an excuse for a lot of different things, but we tried to just be Americans, you know, we're gonna be very friendly, uh, <laughs> and open it up to everybody, and I think that was a real strength of what we tried to do.